Io comincio. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. The warmest welcome to Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. I am Andrea Mina. I'm wearing my hat as Director for International Relations. In the spare time, I'm also Professor of Economics at uh, Scuola Sant'Anna. It is a pleasure to have you all here, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to kickstart uh, the proceedings uh, of this uh, symposium. I wanted to make a brief um, introduction, especially for those of you who are not familiar with the school, and you'll have time to learn more about the Scuola Sant'Anna, Scuola Normale, and Pisa in general over the last uh, three days, uh, including today. And I trust that you'll find opportunities also to enjoy a bit of spare time. Despite the weather, you'll find that the city is very beautiful in any condition, okay? Um, you are in a fairly old room, in a fairly old establishment, uh, but in a rather young university. Sant'Anna is ranked uh, very highly internationally among the young universities of the world, according to um, the Times uh, Higher Education rankings. Um, as you know, you are in Tuscany, and I want to sort of uh, give you a few um, figures uh, about uh, the concentration of academic activities and research that are present in this lively region of Italy. You have overall seven universities and 43 national research centers. Um, you have in excess of 100,000 students. Uh, you have uh, various uh, districts uh, specialized in overlapping fields. Some of them have very old histories uh, in the history of the economy of the region. Um, you have hundreds of labs, a very, very high concentration of researchers to uh, population shares. Um, on a per capita basis, uh, um, a very good intensity of entrepreneurial activities. Fairly successful track record of uh, um, competitive uh, research projects, one including ERC brands. More specifically, you are in a city of art and culture. You are in a city of science. This is, after all, the birthplace of Galileo Galilei, who was born in Pisa in 1564. You see in the middle the coat of arms of the city of Pisa from the old glorious tradition of the Maritime Republic. Um, in Pisa, you have uh, the large University of Pisa, which is one of the oldest universities in Italy. You have our esteemed colleague of Scuola Normale Superiore, who are also represented here today, of course, and um, you'll be at Scuola Normale tomorrow. And then there's us, we were established more recently, 
in 1987. Um, in Pisa, you also have the presence of the um, National Research Council and uh, um, important uh, um, research investments uh, in nuclear physics with the National Institutes of Nuclear Physics. You are um, in a young public university with a special statute, which in the Italian systems uh, is called uh, Scuola Superiore Universitaria. Our undergraduate students uh, are enrolled uh, contemporaneously at the University of Pisa generally. Um, and they take extra specialist courses at Scuola Sant'Anna. Entry is by merit. And um, our students uh, um, are waived uh, fees, they're given accommodation and granted the opportunity to live in a college environment. Um, we're deeply committed to joining up teaching with research. And it is, I think, very fitting that the central theme of uh, the event that begins today um, speaks uh, very, um, very deeply to the core mission of the school. This is just to give you some facts and figures, and I'm quite sure that you can peruse this slide without me detailing as I speak uh, all the figures. Um, we have uh, first level training joined um, with the University of Pisa as a three plus two sort of structure. Um, we have uh, launched uh, very successfully, if I may say, um, a series of uh, seasonal schools, so which are specialist uh, uh, courses uh, of whose duration is one or two weeks uh, with a very strong mission oriented and strong um, interdisciplinary flavor. Um, we have MSc degree courses, we have uh, PhD programs, uh, and we have, of course, tailored uh, higher education programs. Um, we have uh, specialist areas of research intensity, and sometimes we like to say excellence. We hope that it is excellence. I believe that excellence has to be proved um, on a daily basis. We have uh, um, specialisms in law, political sciences and development, economics, management. Um, we have uh, three engineering institutes, the Institute of Mechanical Intelligence, um, the Institute for Telecommunications, Computer Engineering and Photonics, uh, and the Biorobotic Institutes. Uh, we have uh, three recently formed interdisciplinary centers, one on health science, one on crop science, and one on plant science. And we competitively won two um, uh, large grants uh, uh, for the uh, Division of Social Sciences uh, um, in the area, uh, one in the area of data science uh, and a second one for the uh, Division of Applied Sciences and Experimental Sciences, uh, um, uh, a large grant uh, for AI research. Um, this is how our research fits broadly um, into SDGs uh, for the period that goes between 2014 and 2020, you can see a um, very strong emphasis on health and well-being, education, growth, inequality, and climate. This is important because we have to ask on a daily basis, why is it that we do part of what we do? And it's important to connect it um, with uh, um, missions, uh, with societal challenges. That's a belief of this institution. We aim to be international. We are international. We, of course, uh, um, place uh, um, great emphasis uh, on doing things uh, um, with our local partners, uh, um, but also to scale up and learn from and with esteemed international partners. Uh, we have a broad range uh, of international collaborations uh, financed through a variety of uh, schemes. Uh, um, we collaborate uh, with uh, small um, emerging nations as well as larger um, research superpowers. And uh, we believe this is important because the problems we face are um, global challenges. We are, of course, especially proud to be part uh, of the ELISA network, which is the very reason why I'm delighted 
to um, welcome you here. And um, I don't want to spend too much time on the presentation of the uh, alliance, um, simply because it will be done afterwards. Uh, and you may already know um, quite a few things. For those of you who are not familiar um, with the alliance, I encourage you to learn more and talk to people and discover the opportunities uh, that uh, this great program can offer. And I'm particularly um, speaking to uh, the younger researchers in the audience. Um, I stop here. And I thank you very much for your attention. We would like to show you um, a video um, that is an overall presentation of some of the uh, facilities and of the of the Scuola Santana, and and also some testimony by um, students, researchers, and um, former uh, alumni uh, of uh, our institution. Uh, and then I will leave the floor uh, to the distinguished chairman who will introduce the video about our very important Sophia. Thank you for your attention and I wish you the most productive event. Piazza Martiri della Libertà runs a tall and ancient wall that today is interrupted at its midpoint, offering a glimpse into a place that for some people is a workplace, for others a university, and for still others is home. This place is the Sant'Anna School of Advanced Studies, a forge for the minds of the future, established on a winning formula, open access to all upon the principle of merit criteria, a small size able to nurture a contained and connected community, multidisciplinarity, internationality, but above all, continuity between research and training for the development of individual talents. A pathway open to talent founded on two words, commitment and training. Giuliano, sei stato Giuliano, you are a Sant'Anna School alumnus. In your view, what's the importance of training in the future of our institution? It was very important for me. At that time, we were young, small town boys, leaving home for the first time. And the experience of being together and exchanging experiences had itself enormous value. And together with what we learn, this led us to the career that each of us went on to pursue. In addition to this, today Santana provides something even more essential for the future world, a world where humanity will survive only if technical innovation and science can provide the tools to overcome big challenges, such as climate change, for example. To face the new challenges, we need a new dimension of training where interdisciplinary studies mix with science as a drive for shaping the professions and the lives of tomorrow's citizens. From this point of view, research and education have never been so interconnected. At the Santana School, research is the gym of education, and this constant contamination between training and research has led to the extension and enrichment of Santana's learning activities. Honor students combine courses at the University of Pisa with an intensive integrative program at Santana, which is not limited to taught courses and seminars, but engages them in lab activities, bringing them closer to research at a very early stage, an essential component to acquire the skills we need to address future challenges. Essere allieve alla Scuola Superiore Santana 
Studying at Santana School means living a unique experience that is difficult to set out into words. It means living immersed in a highly stimulating environment where professors, researchers and your peers enrich you every day and strengthen your learning skills. Living together for us is the key for supporting and helping each other. Since 1987, the year of Santana School establishment, its buildings were refurbished and renovated. The headquarters and the college were transformed to offer higher standards for students' accommodation. The San Gerolamo Cloister turned from a simple lawn with a well in the middle to the vibrant center of lessons and seminars. It was further restored in 2022. The canteen, which was once in the space now occupied by the library, moved to a new building behind the cloister and was considerably expanded. The place where students used to play games is now the auditorium and assembly hall. In the last few years, new students' residents were opened, such as Collegio Terzani and Collegio Faedo, and shared with the students of Scuola Normale Superiore, because interdisciplinarity is nurtured also through friendships and cultural exchanges with Scuola Normale, our most esteemed partner. Finally, the recently opened cafeteria, a new meeting place, because scientific thought is built together. In our country, we sometimes perceive a climate that is competitive and concerned about the future. In this context, our college seems a provocation, a good provocation. Santana School teaches us that only together we can succeed and help the development of our country. This is why I and other alumni employed as public servants are now committed to put what we have learned here at the service of institutions to give back at least part of what we received. Public institutions and enterprises require innovation and connections between basic and applied research. This is the concept inspiring Santana's PhD programs. The catalogue of courses increased significantly since the birth of Santana. In 1987, Santana offered six programs, which became nine in 2007, with a new vision of postgraduate training focused on cutting-edge research and interdisciplinary approach. Today, Santana offers 10 PhD programs, complemented by 12 national or inter-university doctoral programs. The number of PhD students enrolled and the share of international students have shown remarkable growth. In 1987, there were 30 students, 88 in 1997, 119 in 2007, 299 in 2017, and today there are 352, with 30% coming from abroad. PhD students attend a personalized training program where courses, teamwork and constant interaction with professors and researchers are integrated with study and research experiences abroad in prestigious research centers and universities. Once more, training and research are combined together to develop awareness, knowledge, skills and scientific method. I always say that I owe everything to Santana School. My origins are from a very normal family in a small town in the province of Cuneo. And thanks to Santana, all doors were open to me. During my study, firstly I went to Paris, then to China, where I had the opportunity to meet my first employer, Iveco, in Chaoxeng and the start in this way of my career in the field of human resources. First Hewlett Packard in Milan and Palo Alto, then Vodafone in Milan and London, UK. Now EY, one of the largest consultancies in the world, where I am director of the human resources department for Italy and Western Europe, from Germany to Portugal. The passion for talent, which is here developed so well, has stayed with me. Every year we recruit about 3,000 people in Italy and 15,000 in Western Europe. Selecting and growing talent has remained in my DNA. Santana nurtures talents for public institutions, research organizations, as well as business. The relationship between Santana and the world of enterprise is not limited to recruitment, but starts from the very beginning of training and develops from career advice to placement. The companies participating in Il Talento all'Opera Foundation support the school in outreach projects focused, for example, on social mobility and girls' access to STEM disciplines, to identify and guide towards university education talented students whose parents did not attend university. The companies work with Scuola to fund scholarships and support placement activities and events, such as Job Fair, an event that aims to create a bridge between education and cutting-edge research. 
and a selection of the most promising entrepreneurial and business opportunities. Our mission is to widen and enrich the training offer at all levels of studies. In 2020, we launched the Seasonal Schools, a large catalog of intensive courses delivered with a rigorous scientific approach to topical issues, open to the best students from Italian as well as foreign universities. Also thanks to the support of the ELISA European University Alliance, the network of entrepreneurial and dynamic universities of which Scuola is a constituent member. Strengthening research and enhancing the training of talents is key to achieve a more sustainable and inclusive world. From its origin until today, Sant'Anna has educated more than 4,000 honor students and PhD students. When Sant'Anna was established in 1987, the number of students enrolled amounted to about 100. Ten years later, this number doubled. Today, Sant'Anna hosts more than 620 honor students and PhD students. Can we do more? Yes, absolutely. In line with our growth potential in research and impact, we can increase the number of students and, by combining the valorization of talent and all efforts in supporting social mobility, we can indeed contribute to the development of the country. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Arti Fiozegir, and I'm an assistant professor of informatics and computer engineering at Istanbul Technical University. Good morning to and all. My name is Sofia Dagian, and I'm executive director for the ELISA Alliance. It is an honor for me to welcome you at the second edition of the Research Based Learning Symposium, a major opportunity to showcase and share and exchange experiences. I would like to thank Escola Normale Superiore and Escola Superiore Santana, rectors Luigi Ambrosio and Sabino Nuti and their teams, and also the ELISA teams, particularly IDU and BME colleagues, for your engagement in the Alliance and for hosting and organizing this ELISA event. As part of the European Universities Initiative, ELISA strives to promote the growing role of universities in identifying and helping to solve challenges faced by their societies. We believe that new realities call for new ways of learning and the acronym of ELISA includes learning innovation at its very center. This is where the symposium and the research-based learning framework comes in, because solving complex societal challenges is an open, creative, but also systemic process in where we all have a role to play. Elisa European University is giving us the opportunity and the space to collaborate, learn together, and to offer inclusive and enriching opportunities for our students. I encourage you to make the most of this symposium, to learn while sharing your knowledge and enjoy everything in this incredible venue that is PISA. I especially encourage you to get to know new colleagues because I cannot think of a better opportunity to start building the living tissue of our alliance. Thank you for the students and partners that had the willingness and the generosity of sharing their experiences, ideas and aspirations within ELISA. Thank you for your commitment. Together we are ELISA and together we are shaping it. And finally, I would like to use this opportunity to invite you all to take part of the first ELISA International Conference that will take place the 4th, 5th and 6th of October in Bucharest. I wish you all the most fruitful day, days in this symposium and thank you. Right, once again, good morning. I was just about to introduce Sophia. No matter. Okay, um, so welcome all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mina for uh, welcoming us. And uh, I'm, I'm a, a member of the organizational committee, so I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the organizational committee for the symposium, and uh, I would also like to thank our local colleagues from uh, Scuola Superiore Santana and Scuola Normale Superiore 
for their efforts on organizing and realizing this uh, symposium. Uh, so today we are going to start with uh, our keynote. Uh, we, we are very pleased to host Professor Andras Kadritsa uh, with his very interesting title, Research-Based Machine or Human Learning. And I would like to introduce you very briefly. Uh, professor Patricia is a full professor at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, graduated in electrical engineering. He received his Doctor of Science title from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and Doctor of Habilitation from DME. The Fault Tolerance System Research Group, founded by him in 1994, is one of the most successful groups in tutoring research students as indicated by the many awards won by the students. He led the computer science and engineering branch of the National Council of Students Research for a decade. He served as a visiting professor at the FAU Erlangen, Technical University Darmstadt, University of Florence, and the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. Professor Patricia has received multiple recognition awards from different scientific and industrial organizations like the Academic Award of the MTA and six IBM Faculty Awards. The President of Hungary honored him with an Officer's Cross of Hungarian Order of Merit. He also has received the Proscientia Honoris Causa Award, which is the highest recognition of the National Council of Student Research. So without further delay, I give the floor to Professor Pateritsa. So many thanks for the introduction. I will give you many times uh, P slash uh, B uh, too long did not read for dealing with artificial intelligence with the chatbots. My career can be rather simply summarized. I give my very first international Talk here in Via Santa, Mar uh, Santa Maria Trenta, say in the that time Mucha Research Institute of Italy. And now, after 46 years, I managed to come here to uh, School of Santa Anna. It is a few hundreds of meters, but a lifelong experience. And since that, uh, we always hope that it is Toscan. So, uh, nowadays, Everybody uh, speaks about the impacts of artificial intelligence. And as someone coming from the border of fault tolerance, uh, I am proud to educate generations of engineers to be paranoid. Don't trust the computer. Don't trust what is the results. And that is what my profession is about. I will not go into details nowadays of technology, among others, because uh, as I read some excellent student reports, I am sure that many of you already know much more of artificial intelligence methods like me. However, uh, as a professor, we face some challenges due to the new technology, and that is what I try to share with you a few ideas. Basically, artificial intelligence is looked at as a kind of disruptive technology, and that is a terrible, huge hype nowadays, despite the fact that artificial intelligence has already its roots roughly 20 years ago in engineering and, let's say, uh, in science, much, much more than. The first point is that if you look then at the volume of data, what are produced is extreme. So I had to look at the internet to check what is a zettabyte, and I printed it out. So many bytes will be produced in 2025. And that is naturally the question what to do with this data. And uh, the prediction by the European Parliament says that in 2035, the labor productivity will grow by about one third, and even it will have an impact on the environment by reducing greenhouse emissions. So let's think about that if we use clever solutions 
for the production uh, transport and similar one, then it is the best if the information travels like the physical goods. So for instance, in one of our projects for a large manufacturing plant, we were managed to cut uh, the manufacturing costs in the terms of energy by 50%, and that was a huge amount simply by a clever ordering of the production. So there is a lot of fantasy here. However, during the time we had experienced already quite a lot of disruptive technologies, and there is a question, what is the difference with artificial intelligence, whether we should use it, or even uh, to prohibit its use, like many people say. And in the history, it uh, started at the beginning of the 19th century, where the new machines were invented in the textile industry, and there was a movement to let's break them because they will uh, eliminate jobs and the families and all the social impacts. What is the truth? I started programming during my secondary school in the 70s, and that is an old Russian computer called Ura 2, and it was worth to look at its performance. But that time we learned algorithms on this. Moreover, uh, I learned the very early form of from engineering. Namely, at the department, we were two of us, me and my boss, who still programmed Ura 2 in binary code. Yes. There were times when we wrote uh, the bits as programs. And whenever we had a larger meeting, and I was heavily in discussion, he looked at me and told 16. 16 was the stop instruction in URL 2. So that was by proper from engineering the message of Shaka. So, as you see, there is nothing new in the world. And uh, finally, starting from the binary, uh, nowadays we do model based engineering. Let's look. Originally, we started to write programs on a sheet of paper. There were no compilers. Later on, assembly had shown up. Later on, there were already algorithms and high level language and at the end we have now a very high level of abstraction so from the binary code which was implementation heavy and we were the translators of our ideas to the language of the computer we continue with this assembly code which facilitated this high level languages were already easier because those were already with an algorithmic focus. And here was the big jump of using computers, because not only a selected team of people who spoke binary, early computer scientists, but even people from economy, biology, and research were able to use that. And as we have modeled this, uh, computing, what is nowadays low code or no code in the business world, computers are available to all. What was the main trend? To reduce the entry pressure. What happened nowadays with chat GPT and similar ones is simply that everyone can access uh, these ones. And on the other hand, uh, this background infrastructure becomes more and more to the blackness. And that is dangerous. The worst error ever, what I had to fight with, that happened under some German colleagues. In the big blue informatic tower in Erlangen, where we developed something and the compiler was So I 
country the dash particular bug. My program was correct, the compiler was wrong, and I hunted three with a simple bug until I found that the compiler had a flow. So what do we see? That the input complexity is less and less, so it is easier to formulate our questions, problems, and so on. The entry threshold of skills to use a technology goes down, the productivity goes up, and it is a question what happens with the quality, and that is something which will be one of my main messages today. At the same time, we face that while in the medieval ages, a guild collected some specialists to build a cathedral, and nowadays we have simple users and specialists. So whenever we speak on the widespread use of a technology, and we speak about black boxes, one of the questions is how much has a simple user, not someone working as a specialist in artificial intelligence, to know about this thing to efficiently and correctly use it. So, in particular, I will ask as main question, what is the impact of the artificial intelligence on the energy living? Education, what are the specific challenges, opportunities, and so like those are my very, let's say, subjective views. There are some papers in the press and media, and usually, what is the first, what I have done, just, just the same as the students. If you don't want to read something in detail, you type TLDR, too long, did not read, create me, give me a summary. And I put one of the papers from the Forbes magazine into it, and I got something which is still useful and for asking more details, the computer wrote something which was nearly perfect. So it was reasonable, and there are texts like this, a part fluent English, a little bit better than that of mine, and a well-structured something. It is useful as a raw material, but we, everybody knows that to read a summary and read in the paper, it is far away, not just the same. In addition, even if it happened to my mother, that time it was mandatory to read long romance in the secondary school that once his uh, uh, teacher asked her that, let's tell me how did it happen as a young aristocrat gave the rose to a lady. My mother told that short story about this and then the lecturer smiled. There was no young aristocrat and there was no young lady who failed. So uh, as we know, lecturer students are, uh, let's say, just the same. But we have to ask what uh, many people are afraid of. Is this a free ticket to automatic plagiarism? Is it a substitute of professors? I'm old enough, I'm not afraid. Uh, or is it a substitute or understanding and learning? When we go for a summary, then artificial intelligence in education bring quite a lot of opportunities, like personalized learning, efficient grading, enhanced accessibility, intelligent tutoring, data driven insights. And uh, when you uh, as we watched the introductory uh, video about these excellent institutions, we see that something similar is the basis of a good education, what is done today. However, we have a risk and the same concept. The first one is data privacy and security. Whenever I ask something from the machine in a public service, I reveal details. For instance, many enterprises simply prohibit to use the public services not to reveal their 
six events through the third party provider. The next one is that these current uh, AI methods are based on learning. If someone learns something from a rest of the knowledge base, then he has a bias. For instance, if you look, what do you know about your national history, European history, and in the world? If I ask what happened, let's say, in Southern America, when Italy unified and uh, was unified, it is a rather strange question because we have all a biased education. And the same is valid for uh, natural sciences. So what, what is the rule of a teacher? Can a teacher compete with artificial intelligence or not? That is one of the problems. We have quite a lot of ethical cons uh, uh, considerations. There are already artificial uh, intelligence based tools to rewrite the text originating in artificial intelligence and uh, let's say to hide the use of technology. And the main concern for me is the loss of creativity and political thinking. Even in the case of my students, I frequently say that they use popular strategy. They have a, pro a problem, they Google it, find a fragment of code, copy, paste, and that is the solution. Okay, that has a background. Design patterns are well known originated in architecture, later on came to computer science, but frequently it is forgotten that to use a pattern, you have no environment, judge whether it is appropriate and so on and so on. So the set of patterns is not an architecture. So let's look what can we do uh, against loss of creativity and critical acid? Still, we use artificial evidence. So, you use Google, you use Amazon, you use Grammarly, and so on. And I made a little bit of experiment. I took the mission statement of Elisa from the web page. I put it into chat GPT, created a summary and started to analyze the language. The first one, I went to Grammarly and let check the language. Large scale uh, language models, you create the text word by word based on similar text. And there were a few typos less than I used to do. And the language quality, it has an overall small A, it's is better than uh, that of mine. And let's say it was not bad, it was not very emotional, and you cannot fine tune. But later on, I tested what happens if I look with Grammarly, which is a built in plugin, it's in chat there to total 32 percent of plagiarism. It is clear because the input was a published text. The surprise was that at first it found that our Spanish colleagues used some phrases uh, for an Elisa announcement. It was misclassified as a plagiarism. It is a, let's say, very valid use. So teachers should not trust and accept a similarity as something uh, which is bad. The second was, was even more interesting it gave an intercompany uh, alliances lead cyber security something. It was a, about a consortium. I read honestly this second reference three times in details. I have no idea why this was indicated as a plagiarism. Simply, we have black box models in the back, black box methods. The new branch existing since a very few of years, explanable artificial intelligence 
is not included into these tools. You get something and you don't know why. There are no arguments for that. In addition, what is nice that checking this text, which was an excerpt of the ELISA uh, mission statement from the me web, web page that was not identified as such. So uh, we are unhappy with this. And during playing with this, I had, I got the following feeling, and that is my advice. This part of at least the recent generation of chatbots are like a not very prevalent student of an oral exam who read quite a lot. However, if they did not understand, this use similarity, but not understand. Artificial intelligence in the current form is not intelligent. It's very certain in doing the low level work, but we feel only that it is intelligence and time to time to give take and random answers. And similarly, as if you feel that someone is uncertain at an oral exam and you try to drill down, modify a little bit of the specification, it gets confused. So finally, it gives quite a lot of fake answers. It began to hallucinate and so on. It lies frequently, it gives non-existing references. So basically, it is currently not a subject of trust. The main problem is that people behind this nice facade of language believe that they get something which is true. Time to time, it is extremely useful. I use it for teaching, for leading projects of my students, but we have each and every time cross check. So my main recommendation here is the following one. Don't trust. You have to check whatever it says. The second one, you have to compare to the ground rules. Sorry. Artificial intelligence can help to learn, but does not substitute. So, and at our side and the teacher side, we should teach little professors. So the students like to behave professors. And when I speak about little professor, I don't speak about the calculator. I speak about the real professors. So, how to adapt engineering education in the practice? Uh, what you see here on the right side, you see it is a picture of an animal. It is part of the training set what most people working in artificial intelligence based image processing use as a training set. Those are labeled training sets. And they are used for different solutions to learn uh, to recognize different kinds of animals. I would be quite unhappy to be in Africa with an artificial intelligence tool which says that this is a monkey. Maybe I would survive. Researchers at MIT checked this scientific bench. It's not a random, not fake news, not social media. Benchmark sets of images, and they are to a high percentage fall. So, hmm, that is not so good. So, the second one is that there are fundamental limitations of artificial intelligence. The, those are recent, highly interesting and highly theoretical proofs that, for instance, if someone finds a good way to misguide a large language model, most probably you can attack others as well. So injecting fake news, for instance, to, to an artificial intelligence based tool can be done at home and reuse against services. However, in the engineering culture, we have something 
quite a long, since quite a long time, how to deal with imperfect systems, ethical change, uh, challenges, societal challenges, and responsible data set men uh, are poor to, to de for developing new artificial intelligence methods. However, we can do more in the conservative way. The core message is system thinking. System thinking is the way, a structured way for engineers to go from the concept through the entire life cycle of an engineering product. And I tried to, to check how does artificial intelligence fit into it. So it is the core. What happens if AI appears here? And my message is that system thinking is the best way to supervise artificial intelligence and use it. We have well established engineering process, uh, processes. I took this one from the systems engineering book of knowledge, starting from the concept that is a well defined road with road signs to go to the implementation. That is, uh, that is one of the models. The left side of the view is the implementation at each level, validation and verification plans are elaborated. And you have to climb up the other branch in order to get to the product. Let's apply when you combine the elements to the system at each level validation and verification. And that is something what is little in the education. When reviewing some research reports, mostly they go down the left branch. But science begins if the results are, are validated and verified. So it is insufficient to go down. We have to come up. And science begins by validated and verified facts. Validation means whatever it is, it is the requirements uh, and verification checks whether we do the individual steps properly. And this has quite a lot of support at first. For the scientific method, many teach them here is the following one. We have workflows, we have processes. How do we deal with science? The second one is on the right side that we have to have uh, our results be producible. We don't need statements. We need validated, published statements. And for instance, Open Scientific Foundation provide a complete complete ecosystem as that. And what we have to enforce in the age of artificial intelligence is use this kind of engineering thinking, namely create, validate, verify, publish, publish your data, make your research reproducible. And that is the way how we can create real science. We publish not for citations, we publish for the public nuclear sciences to do this. So my takeaway is artificial intelligence is a help. It is not a, su a substitute. We cannot completely trust. We have to enforce system thinking and what is especially lacking from art artificial intelligence multi-aspect thinking, validation, verification processes from the backbone of research. Teachers should act as assessors of this process and results. And that is something for which safety critical systems provide even strict models. And finally, scientific method, open science in its entirety provides Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Katarica. And unfortunately, we don't have time for questions after this very interesting talk. In the interest of time, we will have to move forward for, uh, for the first session. Uh, maybe we can take a very short five minute break when the speakers get ready. And we will see you in five minutes for the first session. And I would like to ask the chair and the speakers of this session to present themselves here. I am Yeah, I think that's fine for your but in the presentation we have to all the things. Yeah, so we can have on set. Yeah, they told me this is to move is no lesser. No, no, I don't think so. Can I send this flash disk? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, no I'm not sure if you have no. only file only file that is my I uh, know. Maybe this but I don't think. Yes. Yeah. Dos minutos y, des y después las preguntas para que haya, haya tiempo de tomar y bueno y luego ya de esto. Pero ellos que han dicho mejor que es Tú ya estás sentado, ya estás sentado aquí. Estamos sacando en dos minutos. No, y si cuando yo me entiendo me confundo. No se la me olvida. Sí. Bueno, pero son de la red, son de internet, pero la gente me. 
Bueno, te voy a pedir un favor, a ver si me puedes hacer una foto por el estilo. Sí, sí, la de la de la de la de la Hello, hello. We are going to about to start like in one minute. No, I didn't have to open the queue for the for the I just uh spoke uh in the Yes, yeah, we're well, I mean, yes. <laughs> I'm teaching telecommunication. So now we are working. Our background is on optical. But now we are expanding the scope to mobile network. We are as I have seen team. You can take degrees for example. Yes. Only PhD. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then second hour. Master? Master? No, Master, they need to be a different hour. 
but you want to do only the other, say, a regular. So, yes, master. Yeah, the, the, the laboratories. Yeah, not only here. Uh, because here is the headquarters, but we have a big uh, facility in the world where the CNR area. So, it's uh, like uh, the outskirts of the uh, half an hour from here and there. And there. We have also laboratory from the other engineers. So basically, engineering, we have two uh, main One of engineering. Thank you. Thank you, comments. One is a uh, bio robot. So, is a big uh, engineering, uh, say, part of the And we have also telecommunication. And uh, also, we yeah. have you are switching to work only at this university in this program? Yeah. So, um, so we can, we can uh, offer courses, for example, in university visa, if they need the uh, help. Uh, because, I mean, currently, university is in the Decided to stop uh, hiring uh, some years ago. <laughs> so people retire. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we have the courses here, so we teach uh, students here. So I might have heard from uh, Andrea, who wants to get extra courses in state here. So they take additional courses, they are taught by us here. Uh, in addition to the ones that they take from here. Then we have our own courses for master or but we are collaborating a lot with UPM in telecommunications. But for example, telecommunication is very hard Yes, we are will be babies. Yeah. And I am in the center of Madrid, but mm. I am the school in Madrid. Yes, yes. I have been uh, uh, to attend in events by the beginning of the church and FODS. I'm extraordinary. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Hmm. I think that one is uh, yeah, computer science. A more, yes, more, more computer science than uh, and that is school that was yeah. uh, yeah. uh, 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 because the communication is good uh, 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 gives a but also by the chemical Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, I I don't recall by heart now the names, uh, but I can double check. I think the link can start, right? I can send you the name of the professor. The How many professors? Oh, that's true. It's who is okay. Uh, I can tell you we are about uh, one hundred and fifty. And the second day, one yeah, we are quite small. Oh, we are. But uh, Lorena, Sina, Gabriel, Luca, yeah. oh, he's missing only one. But yeah, yeah. he's over there. He's over there. Yeah. We are all. Yeah. He's over there. Yeah. He's over there. Okay, so we are going to start. Uh, we are on the on the research based uh, learning approaches first session. Okay, my name is Oscar Santos uh, from the uh, UPM. Um, we are starting with uh, Loredana Manasia from the UPB uh, in Bucharest. Uh, she's going to talk about imagine innovation in higher education and exploration of innovative pedagogies through photo voice. So thank you. We are going to have uh, 13 minutes and so uh, for each uh, speaker. Then we're going to have three minutes for questions. And then at the end, we are going to have 
more room for questions. So thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Good morning, all. My name is Lordana Manasia, and I'm an associate professor with the Department of Teacher Education and Social Sciences at the University Polytechnica of Bucharest. And I hope you really enjoy stories because that's what we are going to do in the next uh, following uh, 14 uh, minutes. Uh, so today I'm going to, to tell you a story and this story. Um, I'm going to, to tell you um, a story and all the stories take us from the known to the unknown towards transformation and eventually change. And of course, that's why today we are not going to have kind of a proper agenda, but a more uh, story wise one. And for that, I'm uh, going to, uh, you know, to use the learner's journey uh, proposed by Bastian Kunzel. Uh, and this is our today's uh, agenda. Why is that? Because uh, our research and the project I'm going to, uh, to present to you uh, leads us from uh, the protagonist uh, towards the need to find uh, innovation, to conceptualize innovation, and therefore to uh, achieve uh, change. And every proper story starts with Obladi Oblada. As I told you, I'm a teacher and I teach pedagogy uh, and learning design. And my story starts back in February 2020, right before the pandemic uh, hit in uh, Romania. And I had this very first class with a freshman students and they were like waiting for what's going to happen uh, in the in the room and we were discussing about uh, education and their impact on uh, on us on the world on societies and at the end of the of that class i made them play a game and uh, at the end of that game they had to uh, uh, choose a song and sing it and they did so. We chose a song and we sang it, and it was Obladi Oblada. Uh, of course, you all know uh, this song. And it was really, really nice. The energy was very positive. And then we moved on, the pandemic hit, and uh, we changed our uh, uh, interactions and we moved into this uh, digital world. Until one day when this amazing, brilliant student sent me a message uh, via Microsoft Teams and she said, you know, teacher, I just listened to that Obladi Oblada song and that remembered me uh, of your uh, classes and of what you were uh, doing, with, uh, the way you were working with us. And I asked her, why was that? It was just because the song? No, 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 you did something different. What was that different uh, I did back then? I don't know, but it was really different. But that student is here uh, today with uh, us, and thank you, Mirella, for uh, bringing that to us. Together with a colleague from the University of Bucharest, we started to look more into that different approach we had, and this thing led us to the hero question. And we wanted to learn more about the students' perceptions on innovation, on pedagogical innovation in higher education. How is that perceived by our students? What is innovation and pedagogical innovation, to be more precise, for them? And of course, we uh, continued our story in search, uh, in search for innovation with photo voice. It's a qualitative methodology where the protagonists, the 43 undergraduates and master students, took pictures uh, for almost one year and a half three semesters. They had, they were not just protagonists of our stories, but they had some magic tools to, uh, to use. And those magic tools were the pixie dust. And of course, in order to take photos, relevant and representative photos, we provided them with some prompts guiding them uh, to select and uh, explain us what innovation is to them. And of course, they needed something more, and that uh, was the enchanted objects. Their smartphones they used to take pictures, their computers, because sometimes there were screenshots. We were 
uh, some of the pictures were taken during the, the pandemic. And of course, they sent the pictures to us uh, via Survey Altemer. And we also had a Microsoft Teams community in order to share our experience, to build a narrative of pedagogical innovation uh, in higher education. And then our search for innovation led us to over 500 pictures presenting all sorts of learning experiences, situations and things the students believed that were depicting uh, pedagogical innovation in higher education. And perhaps you are curious to learn more about what we found as pedagogical innovation. First of all, we found that there are three drivers that uh, build or contribute to achieving pedagogical innovation in higher education. And those are people, places, and the future, the orientation towards future. And of course, there are also uh, conceptual nodes uh, that center uh, the innovation. And those conceptual nodes are empathy, ecosystem orientation, sustainability, and of course, technology. At the intersection of those uh, drivers and conceptual nodes, we identify four types of pedagogies. Hero pedagogies, community and solidarity pedagogies, green pedagogies, and technologically enhanced pedagogies. And let's move on and learn a little bit more about hero pedagogies. Well, hero pedagogies, uh, Place, place a strong emphasis on empathy and on nurturing the concept of duende uh, in the educational uh, context. Perhaps the Spanish colleagues are more familiarized with the concept of duende, but what the students told us via the pictures they took and sent to us was that they were exposed to experiences where the teacher really, really enjoyed uh, what they were doing and they were building empathy, they are building a sense of trust. And of course, they put uh, in those learning activities and situation their passion, authenticity and creativity. And the hero pedagogies achieve transformative learning. You don't need fancy technological tools. You just need to be yourself to be a teacher, a real human in front of your students, communicate with them, talk to them and with them, engage uh, in uh, common situations and in, uh, in transformative activities with them. And that would translate into empowering students to become empathetic, creative and socially um, conscious individuals. But that's not the only pedagogical tool uh, we can use as teachers uh, in higher education. We also have community and solidarity uh, pedagogies, and they are built around ecosystem and future oriented. The students told us that they were exposed to a situation where they were able to apply their knowledge and skills to solve real world problems. And they felt valued, they felt uh, worthy and they meant when they engage with uh, ecosystems, stakeholders and community actors in order to become active changers of this, uh, of this world. And uh, on the top of this collective responsibility and the ecosystem building uh, actions, they were engaged in actions and situations that could uh, make them more responsible and uh, build interconnectedness and solidarity within those ecosystems. Another relevant tool we found and this was this approach of green pedagogies. Green pedagogies are really, really oriented towards the future. The students explained to us that they were exposed to situations where it's not only the a real uh, feeling of doing something of that practical action, but they were engaged in projects, in activities that put forward a sense of uh, caring for the future, for our collective future. It's not trading the future, it's building a more sustainable future uh, together. What they did was to engage in interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary activities, in projects and 
that was in order to become responsible stewards of the future. And we reach our uh, final uh, set of uh, innovative pedagogies, and these are technologically enhanced pedagogies. They, of course, use uh, cutting edge technologies in order to create adaptive and personalized learning for our uh, students. Uh, they are doing the transformation, not through human interaction, as we saw in the hero pedagogies cluster, but they are doing it uh, through technology. The transformation is done uh, through this uh, means and uh, teachers using this technology, uh, uh, technological enhanced pedagogies are able to create dynamic, interactive and personalized uh, learning uh, activities and environments. And the story is the, uh, it's coming to, uh, to an end because the idea of those four clusters of innovative pedagogies is that we can care for people, we can care for our future, we can care for each other, uh, for each other's, and also we can leverage technology in order to build this interconnectedness and the sense of ecosystem in a better and more fruitful way. And of course, what we need to keep in mind is that if we want to achieve pedagogical innovation, we have to take obladi, oblada. Thank you. Okay, so now we have some time for questions, comments. So meanwhile, you're thinking, uh, uh, Loredana, I was wondering um, if you can explain to us a little, bit, a little bit more what you mentioned about the the duende kind of aspect uh, regarding, for example, all the teaching atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, that creates in a room. And if you can maybe tell us uh, an example so we can picture a little bit the idea. OK, thank you for the for the question, uh, Oscar. Can I ask you another question, please? To me? Yeah. Oh, sure. So do you smile at your students? I try. Yeah, and they reply back. Do you get any smiles from your students? It depends. Okay. It depends of the of the topic. But it happened at least once in your yeah. future lifetime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you ever uh, uh, sang a song with your students? Uh, no. Okay, so you have to work a bit on this uh, duende approach to your uh, uh, to your pedagogy. But I think. There is nothing special about uh, El Duende and the way we are teaching our lessons. It's about being present, being mindful in that very moment. If you smile at your students, if you try to see them, then you will get something from them. It is not just the knowledge, is their empathy, is their presence in your uh, classroom. If you discuss with them, if you uh, engage them in learning activities where they can share that experience and they can build the sense of uh, responsiveness uh, in relation to other uh, to others uh, ways of thinking and perspectives. I think you're on the right track to build your uh, when the pedagogies. Okay, so I was wondering as well is kind of a this is special connection that or this is special kind of a scenario that you can build in a classroom. So is, is, is that idea, right? To make or to try to at least each session to build that connection so you create that sense in the classroom? Yeah, the sense of bonding is very, very important because the main idea of those pedagogies, of hero pedagogies, is that we are protagonists of the story. Learning is a story. Learning is a journey. We start from that known. You, we are all in a state of calm. Uh, and then you enter the classroom and you want to challenge them. Okay, you can challenge them with, I don't know, uh, uh, what made you smile today or bring perhaps a more challenging uh, question. But then they are your protagonists and they take this path from 
that state of calm towards a more challenging approach and then changing uh, themselves. And another uh, key uh, aspect of uh, Shiro pedagogies that students told us uh, is the fact that they feel the warmth mm -hmm. of the interactions. It's creating relations, interacting with your students. It's a two-way street, teaching and learning, and then receiving feedback, smiling at them, being human. That's uh, that's El Duende. And of course, you can add a bit of Vladi Vlada. Okay. Yeah. Any comments, any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Amina, for uh, for the questions. Uh, well, I think, or at least from my experience and from the research project we uh, we have conducted, uh, you don't need a special time to do that. You can do it within your everyday uh, uh, courses, uh, because the design of the uh, learner's journey we saw on the on the screen the cycle proposed by Bastian Kunzel says that we can do that every single time when we enter the auditorium or the lab room or, or the uh, or the classroom uh, and we start with creating a bond and that can be done in so many ways i don't know i use music for my students i Okay, uh, uh, when they enter the classroom, they will uh, be able to listen so, to some music. Um, I always have an opener and that's something that focuses on them uh, and not on the content of the subject we are going to discuss within uh, that course. And I think that's the very first moment. You greet someone when we meet uh, we meet them as we did uh, when we uh, met uh, a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, you gave me a hug. Well, I think we cannot uh, give hugs to all our students, but I think we can create context where they feel uh, welcome to to the uh, to the class. And then is the challenge, and the challenge could be anything: a real, a big idea, or a real world problem. And that could be um, split in so many small questions that can be approached during the, the course. And of course, uh, it's also important to combine pedagogies is an, a key aspect to achieving innovation. So you create this bonding, you create this sense of togetherness in the classroom, in, or, in your auditorium, and then you engage them in something that's relevant, that's authentic, and that relates to them from the perspective of the competencies and the skills and the knowledge they need to achieve at the end of your course or at the end of the uh, of the study program. That's uh, that's the idea. And then you can uh, use, of course, uh, community and solidarity pedagogies and teach them, as uh, we did in uh, Madrid uh, a couple of weeks ago, that uh, engineering is also for people and you know, you have to engage with them, you have to know them, you have to think of them and empathize uh, with them. And then at the end of the course, you can choose something to close up your uh, your course. What's your main takeaway? But this can do can be done in a more creative way. What's your transformation? Ask them in a very explicit way. What did they uh, take from your course from that? from that particular uh, learning experience. Perhaps they don't have the answer, but for sure they will reflect about it. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much again, a big applause.
an excellent an excellent example of our ELISA uh, partners and topics, so interdisciplinary uh, approach through that case education. So now we have our second uh, speaker, uh, Sina uh, Martin uh, from uh, FAO. Uh, she's going to talk about integration of research-based learning in the study program of uh, medical engineering at FAO. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will skip our LAO slide. Um, yeah, thank you very much. My name is Sinem Martin from the Institute for Factory Automation and Production Systems at the FAU LAO in Nuremberg. And I just want to give you a brief overview of how we establish the research-based learning approach into our study program, mostly and focus on medical technologies, since this is also my study time. So I want to start off with a short fact that I'm not sure if everyone's aware of, that actually in Germany, we have two different types of universities. So on the one hand, we have universities which are more driven to industries and which are more of applied science. And on the other hand, we have in the, we have universities that are fully um, driven towards science and towards knowledge generation. So on the one hand, those other universities do have more of an industrial um, collaboration style, and they do want to educate engineers and applied science. And on the other hand, we have um, universities like the FAU which wants to um, drive new findings, new um, research, research, and this is also why we try to incorporate the research-based learning approach into our study programs. So um, a brief introduction to our university before I start over to um, give you an overview of how we incorporate this approach in our um, study program. So we are located in the southern part of Germany in Erlangen, which is like one hour to the north of Munich, which I think most of you know. And we are um, centered in the so-called Medical Valley, which is a cluster of um, a lot of medical industries and which is really a nutritious um, region for the medical technologies area in this part. As I told you, the FAU is a science um, based university, which is divided into five schools, and um, all the schools spread across uh, the different um, types of um, science that we have, so um, uh, across all of the disciplines. We then separate in departments and in institutes, and there within our institute, the Institute of Factory Automation and Production Systems, is one of 10 institutes now from mechanical engineering. Our institute itself, and this is also why I'm talking about medical technologies today, um, is split into eight different research areas. Um, which is, uh, they are also um, directed towards different industry branches. So um, we have um, spread the knowledge towards the different industries. And um, I, I'm the director of medical technologies. And this is also my um, study background, which is why we uh, take a deeper dive into medical technologies now. Our master program of medical technologies is divided into different modules, which can be filled with different courses. So um, you have uh, different um, packages that you can fill up with your um, yeah, interests and thoughts and different courses that you think that can intersect well and can um, model your profile that you want to be after the master's program. And you can identify um, within those modules already three um, big parts that are driven towards research-based learning. So we have on the one hand um, the uh, catalog of the seminars where we have a more theoretical um, research-based learning approach and we have a more practical part, which are our lab modules, where the students also used to um, yeah, be taught how lab works, how um, the 
protocols were followed, they have to document everything. And of course, I think the master thesis is something that is um, a thing that for um, each university and each um, study program counts that they um, students get a project, a master thesis project, and they do have to um, develop all the steps of research. So um, dive deep down into the data and have a look at the uh, at the literature and then um, yeah, execute a project. So the first one that I want to talk about a bit more in detail is our seminars that we're giving to the students. And our seminars usually have some um, general topics, like, for example, you have operating room of the future, and um, the students take a topic within this greater topic to um, take a deep dive into the literature and um, search for novel approaches and present it to the other students. So um, within this course or within this module, we want to um, give the students the opportunity to um to know or to um, analyze and present a research topic and to also um reflect on whether the information is true or not we already heard about jet gpt so um they can use it but they do have to try to verify the um, information they get and they, they do have to um in insert a written report where um we have um already the uh, the education in writing scientific papers and stuff like that. A more practical approach is then our laboratory experiments, um, where they do have to execute different laboratory um, tasks, and the, they have to um, document the laboratory and journal and the laboratory and proceedings, like um, you have to do it when you try to um, yeah, document all your data, be uh, um, transparent with your data, and be consistent in your documentation. So um, normally the students in there get like a small introduction um, to the topic, to the methodology, and then they have to expand their horizon, expand their um, knowledge by themselves, sometimes in small groups where they can execute the task by themselves um, under the guidance of us. And the third part is more or less like the uh, combination of uh, those two approaches. So we have on the one hand the theoretical part and on the one hand the practical part. So it's like a miniature ma master or bachelor thesis where you have a uh, um, to write an individual report, so you have to um, dig down into the literature, you have to search for relevant um, sources, then you have to uh, apply criteria for the evaluation and for uh, the executed tasks. You have a practical part where you can um, do some tests in the laboratory, you have to document them, and you also have to um, insert the or you have to write a documentation, which is more or less like a scientific paper. So um, sometimes we also use our students um, as, or we take our students as co-authors. So it's not only a, um, work that they do within the university uh, framework, but also um, they're going to be um, real co-authors from real publications. And um, these, um, modules also intersect, so we also have the opportunity to give out um, bigger and larger projects um, to be executed uh, in several weeks with um, sometimes in two groups of two or three or in individual tasks, um, which allows us to um, give them a bit more the opportunity to work, by, uh, work on their own and get more um, knowledge out of the project. And I do want to encourage all of the ELISA partners because I think um, all of those practical parts are um, really interesting ways to um, to enable the students' mobility. So to move one student from one university to another uh, university, since these modules are also um, recognized by our um, by our university. So if a uh, an FAU student comes to your university and, and does a project like this, um, he or she can evaluate, uh, get it evaluated at the FAU as well and 
vice versa. So this is, was my brief introduction. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to ask the answers to questions. So I don't know if you have any comment or questions. So I just, meanwhile, you're thinking. So um, I was wondering if you can explain a little bit more about uh, how uh, the students uh, need to choose the individual project. So because I can see that it's a broad field. So um do they talk to the to the advisor do they choose the chair there are some topics each year that you, that the institution of uh, of the uh, laboratories uh need to focus it depends on the project there are any community based kind of projects regarding to medical engineering so if you can explain or describe a little bit more about this of course. So we do have um, different types of how the students get to um, get their topics on uh, of their projects. So on the one hand, we have those seminars, and there are um, like the greater topic, and within those topics, some chairs used to give um, several op options, and you can choose one option. And on the other hand, um, some chairs um, just leave the topic open, and the student can um, look within the field and uh, decide or discuss with the supervisor. Um, I found some new imaging technology, for example. I would like to um, get to know more about this technology. So um, I would like to uh, perform a project on this topic. And uh, for the more practical parts for the laboratory and the research laboratory, we normally have the mechanism that uh, those students look for a um, supervisor or a PhD student mostly, which will supervise the um, master student and um, ask them if they have any topics open. And we normally discuss with the students which topic is open, which interests do the students have, and how we um, get to a uh, yeah, common sense. Thank you. So ah, we have another question coming, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, the the ecosystem of uh, medicine is really interesting in Erlangen. So um, we do use the ecosystem. We also have seminars which are um, given out to students by the medical faculty. So the um, faculty faculties do intersect. We not only we're from the me mechanical department, but we also have um, the Department of Informatics involved with data processing and everything. So um, there are intersections and sometimes there are also industry projects which are driven by um, students. For example. <laughs> they, uh, thank you. Today in campus, uh, uh, any uh, reflection, visual reflection about the process? And if you uh, can uh, give us any insights about what students think about research based learning? Thank you. Um, we do use structures from different journals. I think that depends a bit on the assistant, on the supervisor, 
which is supervising this or who's who's supervising the student. So um, it, it depends a bit, but we do give them a guided structure and we um, also help them to analyze structures of different journals to um, make the first step to analyze, okay, um, how um, big is the is the introduction part, the state of the art part, um, how profound you have to do your research to be part of the journal. Sometimes we um, have two projects which intersect quite a bit and they can write their own journal to give their, to get their grade and in the greater uh, perspective they are publishing together with the assistant and with the help and the supervision of the assistant. And I think um, they really like it because it's more practical and it's also something you can write in your um, CV afterwards because you've already published and that's really nice. Okay, so thank you very much. Now we have our uh, speaker number three. So Gabriel Pinto from the UPM and he's going to present about cases for research based STEM learning through the subject of chemistry. Good morning and thank you, Oscar. Uh, I will speak uh, shortly about uh, uh, a way to introduce STEM learning. I think that everybody knows here what is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics through a specific subject, the chemistry of the first course in uh, engineering degrees. Maybe the opposite that before has been spoken about all the degree. Here is from the point of view of a subject. Obviously, we think or we speak about the, the teaching and learning uh, with a research base, but not the traditional laboratory, but in the in the class, in the ordinary class, no? Uh, after speaking a bit about uh, what is research-based learning, I will explain three uh, cases as a few samples of uh, other uh, examples that we made at the, at the classroom. Then our challenge is to improve the students' motivation, to encourage the critical thinking, and to promote also from the first course, the science, literacy, and social responsibility. Our goals are uh, to facilitate to our students the acquisition of concept about STEM, not only chemistry, and collaborate on, the, on a few competencies. And also to, to bring to students the opportunity to know about research outcomes from the first course. For that, we uh, use several uh, methodologies and specifically, as uh, is the, the object of this uh, symposium, the research-based based learning. I must say that we are not alone in the UPN. We have the collaboration of the university because we are uh, 3,000 professors, 3,000 teachers, and we have not a preparation in pedagogy. Then there is a section in the UPN about innovation in education. And for example, among courses and symposiums and so on, uh, we have a lot of information about different uh, contemporary methodologies in English and in Spanish. For example, we can find uh, what is the research-based learning and is a way to, to start with the work of our students. We have not only reports, but also infograms. For example, we have here what is the, the, the essence of the, the research-based learning. And we, we are also the opportunities to, 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 to share our uh, experiences among other teachers. No? Then I will speak about uh, three cases. For example, this first case 
uh, is uh, a methodology that we use the first day of the class, the first day of the course, to introduce the students in the scientific method. Is only an answer. Where will met before an ice cube? In water or in saturated salt water? Our uh, end is that uh, students do that at home, at the kitchen. It's very simple and they can solve the problem by research. They must discuss and so on. I have no time to describe it uh, slowly, but the important is that they must do the experiment in, in team at home. Also, in order to see the difference, they can add a drop of colorant, food colorant, and they found the, the answer contrary to almost people, uh, uh, teachers of chemistry and physics also think that is quicker the process in the saline solution and is the opposite. Why? Because it is a problem of densities and the formation of uh, convective currents. But the important here, it is not only the process, but how we can uh, work with the students more things than they are uh, funding. For example, we, we can make with them another studies. And what good, what, what good is all this? It is only a, a question, a simple question. No, there is applications. For, for example, in the thermo-aligned circulation of seas, or for example, in the microplastics transport in the oceans. Then it is important that the students at the first course discover that they own at the kitchen of uh, at home a question very important for the circulation of the, the water in the planet and also in the in the microplastics. No? Also, for example, we have connected this experiment to the opposites. A colleague of my department researched about the formation of ice in several moons of Jupiter then the students at the first course can see at least what a, a teacher, a research do, for example, in this case, to modelize the formation of ice. Because we use the same program, but to the opposite, and the program gives the same results that uh, students found by own. Other example that we work with our students, it's an apparently a strange question, that is, what do Spanish botijo? It is a ceramic traditional object made uh, thousands of years ago in order to have in summer cold water. And then without science, without technology, thousands of years before, people in Spain and other countries in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, uh, countries uh, found by experience this object. What is, is in common with this object, pot in pot, that allows girls in uh, several vi village of Nigeria go to a school? Thanks to this object, uh, known as pot in pot, with the with a similar uh, for the background as the botijo, uh, the the foods, the vegetables can be preserved during few days, and also is the same mechanism that this very well known toy, scientific toy, that is the drinking bird. All three questions have in common the the evaporative cooling no? thanks to the evaporation of water and the evaporation heat the there is a cooling of water and there is a mathematic and a physics uh, very high for students for first course but they can find 
what they must study during the degree, thermodynamics, physics, mathematics, and so on, no? And they can only see a, a bit these expressions, but we can work with a lot of concepts, physics, technology and engineering, chemistry, geology, mathematics, biology, because we study also the, the kinetics of the food degradation, sociology, why it is this was important in Spain, why it is important in Nigeria and other countries, art, because the ceramic is a traditional art, and geography. Uh, it is a uh, very good example of STEAM with the A of arts education. And students can do a lot of works at the laboratory. We have uh, made several degree with the GRS degree uh, thesis in order to study this, this kind of things. No? Also, we have studied the uh, influence of the geometry on these objects. Also, why it is not known in other countries, because uh, it is typical of countries with dry uh, weather. No? And we, have, uh, we must also have uh, clay to, to, to do these objects. Also, for example, now there is a, a, a student doing a, a final degree thesis about uh, the Jack Child, that is uh, buildings in, in, in Iraq and Iran, made also for the same, to preserve, for example, ice. And it is also used as an irrigation system. Then, as I have no time, I must uh, I can say that other example we have done with our students is the study and discussion about uh, this object that is a self-heating beverage sold in Spain, where the base is a chemical reaction, but there are a lot of questions around uh, it. For example, we discuss with uh, students what are the advantage and disadvantage of this uh, object and also how can they design the same beverage but for cooling them not to heat but to cooling and only say finally that among other questions that upn uh, asks to students for example the, the the question about this subject chemistry is important for my future professional activities, then well, thanks to this kind of, of relationships between chemistry and STEM and research-based uh, education, we, we are happy the, with these uh, answers, no? Okay, this is all. Thank you very much. Any common question? Uh, I have a like a curiosity. Uh, I was wondering how is changing these projects through the years, through the classes, through the different type of students. So, did you see any difference? Yes, I think that students more and more uh, likes to see the connections. Uh, between uh, the subjects at the first course with all the, the applications. Then we have started these questions 20 years ago, for example. We have advanced it with other examples and so on. But more and more students uh, want to touch engineering from the first course. Thank you. And, and I think that you just mentioned a, a very important thing, like this idea of touching and as well the connection that you make with the arts yes. in with the ceramics and as well I was I was writing down as well with this idea of the botijo so for example as well part of the arts not thinking as well only arts as the traditional idea of arts as well as critical thinking ethnography 
we see culture as well, anthropology. So this idea of arts more like closer yeah. to the Anglo-Saxon idea of critical thinking and as well of knowing of social sciences. Any common idea? Okay, so thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are moving to Luca Balcarenghi. Luca Balcarenghi de la Escuela Superior de Santana, and he is going to talk about research based learning in communication networks. Hello, good morning to everyone, and welcome also from uh, myself to the Scuola Superiore Santana. I'm Luca Valcarenghi, and I'm an associate professor at the TECIP Institute of the Scuola, and the TECIP stands for Institute for Telecommunication, Computer Engineering, and Photonics. Okay, so this is a short summary of my, my talk. Uh, I will give you a short introduction. Uh, then I will go to the Galileo Galilei scientific method. I, I, I swear that I didn't uh, look at the previous presentations so before making mine. So it's uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, it happened that we dealt with the similar topics. Then uh, I will uh, uh, connect RBL with curiosity. And uh, I will give you some uh, ideas of how we would like to stimulate curiosity in the students and then provide my conclusions. So, uh, as we have heard from uh, Professor Andrea Mina at the beginning, uh, uh, Pisa is the city in which uh, Galileo Galilei was born. Um, and as we heard from uh, Professor Patarisa, uh, we have that uh, on the right hand side, you can see the scientific method that actually was the one introduced by, by Galileo Galilei. And so these are the steps uh, and are well known. So you have to make observations, uh, ask yourself questions, and this is actually uh, very much related to the curiosity. Then formulate some hypotheses, and through prediction and test, you can either confirm that this, this, this hypothesis is true and then formulate a thesis, or do more experiment once you have uh, you learn that the hypothesis is wrong. So this is, I think, uh, are the basis of uh, how we shall do research. So uh, how we relate RBL with curiosity? Uh, I just stole the image from a, a nice book that I found on the web, and it was actually related to the uh, Mars rover that was named Curiosity. Um, so RBL and curiosity. I think that is a strict relationship with the, between RBL and curiosity. Uh, think about uh, uh, what uh, curiosity is what really stimulates research. So we would like to understand why things are happening, like uh, uh, a small child that needs to understand uh, how things are working. So uh, how can we stimulate curiosity? So first of all, we could stimulate the curiosity, and I might say some obvious things, but this is what we are doing, to hands-on courses. So we invite students from all the degrees. Uh, as you know from Professor Mina, we have mostly PhD uh, courses to come to the lab and to experience hands-on on some experiment on some devices we have. For example, in telecommunication, we have uh, um, more than a million euros worth of equipment. So it's something that you cannot really find uh, uh, around many places. And so this is one, I think, one uh, uh, ingredient to this recipe and to stimulate curiosity. Then the second ingredient for us is to involve students in research projects. Uh, this is really important, is to stimulate curiosity by interacting with other researchers because uh, uh, cross-fertilization, I think, is very important. So we invite students to participate, uh, to work and collaborate with other research in the many research projects that we have. Uh, just, just to mention some of them, in this year, we uh, were awarded five uh, 
uh, European projects uh, uh, by uh, Horizon Europe. So uh, we have a, a lot of work to do. Then uh, another ingredient is to involve students in collaboration with industry. Why? Because industries might have uh, uh, slightly different objectives than research. So in this industry, they are looking for very short term research. So something that will be implemented in one year or less. Maybe in a research project, we look for something that will be implemented in two, three, four, five years. So that is a different way of uh, stimulating curiosity for students. And uh, last but not least, uh, to involve students in communication and dissemination activities. Um, so interact with peers, peers that can be students, but also with the general public. Why I'm saying that? Because sometimes, and this is from my experience, the general pub public might have some, I would say, very simple questions, but that challenge what uh, the researcher is doing. For example, from my experience, uh, sometimes we are asked to translate what we are doing in simple words to communicate it to the general public. And that is not easy. And that actually, I think, helps students to simplify their concept, to be able to uh, broaden the, um, let's say, uh, possibility of uh, disseminating the, their results to the general public. So at the end of the day, uh, so I'm concluding my presentation, um, how my recipe uh, for implementing research-based learning in telecommunication is, uh, uh, as Professor Pinto said, uh, ground uh, RBL on solid theoretical basis. So this is the starting point. So you, ne you need to learn theory. But then having students in the labs, involving students in research projects, and collaborating with industry, and involving students in communication and dissemination activity, and of course, involve students in, in ELISA and in similar initiative. One more thing I have to say, um, I'm also a director of a PhD program. So uh, just a little bit of, of advertisement. Uh, if you happen to like Italy and come to Italy for the PhD, the call is open until May 31st. So you are welcome to browse our web pages. And if you like, uh, please apply. Thank you very much. Any comment, question? Yes. Um, so thank you for the presentation. So my question is, uh, how are you connecting the industry and the students? So like, um, in the, does the industry comes to you and say like, okay, we have a problem and we need a research and you uh, students or students like ask the industry? In, in general, we are like uh, the proxy or the liaison between students and industries. And sometimes we have, uh, 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 for example, in for what concerns our institute, we have a long-term collaboration with Ericsson. So sometimes we have this uh, long lasting relationship with Ericsson and sometimes we in our courses, we can offer students some uh, opportunities to do like uh, uh, small projects related to these problems that we are facing uh, with in the collaboration with industry. So this, uh, this is a possibility. So part of the course will imply solving maybe uh, I would say a simplified problem that the industry is, is asking us. And then there is also the possibility for internship in the industries and for doing some experience in the industry itself. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you. So we are going to move to our last speaker.
Ismail Bajazid from ITU, and he is going to talk about the M key M604 advanced topics in mechatronics engineering. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, event. Uh, this is Ismail Bayezid. Uh, I'm a member of Istanbul Technical University. This is shortly myself. Uh, I'm a, a department vice chair of uh, Istanbul Technical University Aeronautical Engineering Program. Uh, and also uh, aligned with uh, ELISA uh, research, uh, teaching, and uh, also community activities under the umbrella of Istanbul Technical University. Uh, I'm a, a co director of ITU model based design and uh, control lab uh, together with Professor Ömer Kemal Kınacı, uh, in aeronautical engineering department. Uh, and this is uh, my short profile. Uh, I'd like to sh uh, start with shortly with my uh, current uh, research and teaching ecosystem and then uh, tell about my laboratory and then one of the case study that we realize research based learning. I should touch with the theory, but uh, we mostly inspired from uh, a Springer book uh, by uh, John Clement and uh, Marie Ann Ramirez uh, named as model-based learning and instruction in science. So, and also uh, on top, we inspired also from our industrial experiences and engagements. My faculty, uh, our university established uh, 2050 years ago. We are uh, this year celebrating our two, 250th year. However, my faculty established first in 1941 under the mechanical engineering program in Gümüşlü campus nearby Taksim site of Istanbul, uh, in the European site of Istanbul, and established in 44, established as a separate engineering department, and in 1983, it is established as a separate uh, program with three uh, sub-departments named as aeronautics, astronautics, and meteorological engineering. Uh, our uh, main research fields uh, are aerodynamics and fluid dynamics, structural design, uh, mechanical vibrations, flight control and navigation, and also software design uh, and embedded software design for vehicles, uh, mostly on aerial vehicles. However, we are engaged with many other uh, vehicle types like automotive and uh, marine systems. Uh, and these are our strategic partners and uh, our students' employment opportunities, uh, mostly in Turkey. However, we have a lot of international collaborators that uh, we can cooperate and our students can find some uh, employment opportunities. Uh, and these are some uh, partnership programs that we realize in search based learning together with industry, where we uh, come up with real case studies uh, in aeronautics and astronautic fields together with the industry, very big industry actually, uh, big uh, enterprises like Aselsan and uh, Turkish Aerospace and Turkish Airlines. So there are many professors and many students jo joined these activities, participated in a lot of case studies and realized their uh, and present their researches at the end of the year. Uh, and they are in the meantime paid. Uh, the students are paid uh, as of uh, their junior and senior years, like third year and fourth year, I mean. Uh, so, uh, then I'd like to switch my laboratory, uh, model-based design and control lab. We mostly deal with uh, model-based design, uh, like model-based teaching. Why I named it, I will uh, come up with theory shortly. Uh, for, uh, I mean, design and control developed for marine, aerial, and uh, road vehicles. Uh, we do vehicle testing and calibration, uh, and two of these uh, ideas, uh, long years, since 2015, it has been opened under uh, aeronautical engineering department, but we realized since two years, under one course named as Advanced Topics in Mechatronics Engineering, these ideas and try to come up with some uh, physical outcomes uh, that I will present shortly. Uh, this is a new place. Firstly, we are very, uh, in a very small uh, place. Then we switched uh, since last year uh, in a big place, which is the uh, third floor of our faculty. 
Uh, and this is another place where we uh, realize some quantum type or some other uh, in-house developed uh, laboratory experiments uh, uh, where we uh, use them for our courses, uh, like experimental engineering course and some other courses to develop their, uh, our students' practical skills. Uh, these are photos from our uh, academic activities uh, under this course named as a, a model uh, like advanced topics in mechatronics engineering, uh, where we develop many uh, uh, academic papers at the end of the, this course uh, since two years, together with uh, Professor Ömer Kemal Kınadi, we are teaching. And uh, we also complete some projects together with my students where they inspired the ideas uh, of the course content and then they implement actually together with industry uh, in automotive and marine field mostly. Uh, so uh, then I'd like to switch with the uh, like difference uh, deviation in between conventional teaching and uh, model-based teaching. Uh, what I mean, uh, shortly to describe the conventional teachings are three hour, three hours, uh, full theoretical lectures, always one-dimensional. The, the lecturer teach, instruct to the uh, other party, uh, elaborate the course with quizzes, midterms, and final exams like milestones uh, to help students to uh, focus more on this course content. Uh, there are uh, home assignments and maybe class projects. Way of learning, mostly one-dimensional, as I mentioned earlier, not uh, very interactive, uh, unfortunately, mostly empty classrooms and mapping students. And what about uh, model-based teaching that I inspired from a Springer book, Model-Based Learning Instruction in Science, and also inspired from many industrial activities. Lectures, lectures with target models, learning pathways for developing understanding and some at the end of the day uh, you have to motivate the students instead of some exams midterms you motivate with some physical outcome expectations like writing report abstracts or some full draft paper can be kind of uh, motivational factors as a concrete factors uh, of the course outcome uh, so, instead of classical exams, more presentations and report writing, projects uh, elaborating skill of planning, creation, simulating and validation, like recycle type of development from uh, benchmarking stage to uh, hands modding stage or real application stage, I mean. And uh, mostly uh, the expectation of the professor is more interactive classes. Uh, the case study where we implement the idea together with Professor Kemal Kenaji, uh, we are uh, co-directors of this course. Uh, we firstly start with seven, eight weeks of lectures uh, focused on model-based design approach, uh, where you implement model in the loop, software in the loop, digital twin ideas, hardware in the loop ideas, and this is highly applicable in many fields like energy and also vehicle vehicle theories like vehicle uh, vehicle industry uh, including marine automotive and aerial uh, we teach simulation tools uh, such as uh, matchworks such as uh, LabVIEW by ni and uh, such as uh, some uh, amazon amazon from uh, siemens uh, and we teach also vehicle dynamics and control uh, to our students for seven, uh, seven weeks. And in, the, in this seven weeks period, we uh, expect students to uh, provide two assignments, uh, like uh, to complete two assignments. Uh, they mostly including simulation activities, like heavy simulation activities uh, within model-based uh, simulation tools and literature review, uh, as you see in the right side, there are two shots from uh, the project. One of them is implementing some uh, controller and uh, modeling uh, on real driving scenario, like autonomous or on, on an electric vehicle. And second uh, case, uh, there is a, a crash uh, happened in 2021 in one of the uh, highways of uh, United States by Tesla car. 
and they analyzed uh, why this happened and how this uh, technology uh, being developed within the uh, second project. And uh, assignment, I mean, not the project, assignment. And the uh, project phase, we uh, help our students within our lab environment, within our class environment. Class is also hybrid to let them to join anytime. Uh, that means uh, professors are physically available in the classrooms or in the laboratories. However, if uh, students like to join uh, outside of the campus, they can. Uh, we expect students uh, some uh, extended abstracts on uh, technologies, uh, like on advanced vehicle technologies, uh, mostly on the topic of model-based design and digital twin. And finally, uh, full draft, uh, that will be the extension of the project one. Uh, and uh, then we finalize with uh, the uh, class presentations. Why we select this topic, as you see, uh, you develop many software and hardware uh, components uh, within a system requirement uh, type, uh, type to uh, rapid control prototyping software in the loop and hardware in the loop. The topic is not important. The important part, how we implement the uh, research-based learning here. Uh, this model-based approach is uh, more capable uh, industry-wise and theory-wise to uh debug uh, the problems in the initial phase uh, especially in automotive sector and uh, economic analysis of that one as you see we need in model based design more investments uh, that's why a bit expensive in the initial phase of the project however in the upcoming phases like manufacturing like most dangerous ones actually and detailed design phases uh, it is more valuable and uh, cheaper let me say and what is at the end of the day, what is our course outcomes? Uh, they are real papers. We submitted this year. We started last year, and second, uh, this is the second year of our course. Uh, we submitted two papers to conference, ICAT conference, which will be happen next next month uh, within Bosnia, Sarajevo, and they are two accepted papers, uh, which are the outcomes of my students, Mustafa Abdel Halek and uh, Irham uh, Irham Jambak. Uh, they are the members of my laboratory. And uh, we submitted three papers to uh, International Naval Architecture and Maritime Symposium. And two journal uh, paper submissions to uh, like Scopus Index uh, Q2 journal, uh, Brodograd near shipbuilding uh, with robust optimal control of a nonlinear surface vessel model and model based design and control of a container ship using parameter optimization. Uh, we submitted one paper which has happened at the beginning of next month, uh, one uh, conference uh, one conference paper, Enhancing Disturbance Rejection in Mean Satellite Attitude Control, together with Emre Sayin. He, he was the member of our course last year. And uh, another journal uh, application to applied ocean research, it is the top journal in the field, actually. And uh, this year in uh, September, I believe, or no, October, uh, a conference uh, name is uh, Autonomous in Land and Short Sea, sea Shipping uh, within Duisburg, Germany. So we submitted one paper there. And another paper to SciTech Conference uh, together with my student Nikolai Line to AIAA SciTech Conference happened at the beginning of next, next year. Uh, the physical outcomes at the end of the day. Since last year, is five journal paper submissions, two project completions, and ten international conference contribution. At, at the end of my presentation, I'd like to uh, sum up with four important points uh, to implement real research-based learning in engineering. First, uh, you have to create the uh, research ecosystem, and this will be reachable by students. Professors also should be reachable by students and they will be always available or partially available in the laboratories. Uh, industry university collaboration is pretty important and uh, more internalization, uh, let me say 60% uh, of our laboratory or of our students within this course, also along with ELISA, uh, is uh, with international students from Egypt, Indonesia and uh, Russia, Iran and a lot of Sudan, as you see in the pictures. Uh, thank you very much for listening.
So do we have any question, comment? Yeah, we have one. With what models, I'm sorry? Uh, lectures with target models. Yes. So can I open my presentation? Yeah. Hmm. Sorry about this. So uh, you mean this one? Yes. Yeah, I would like to interest it. What do you mean, or can you so actually, describe a bit more? Yes. Uh, so uh, this uh, course that we are teaching is advanced topics in mechatronics engineering, both with MKM six or four. Our target model is uh, model based design engineering, model based design and control, and we want students, especially in the field of uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle, different vehicle uh, models like automotive vehicle models, uh, marine vehicle models, or aerial, maybe space vehicle models. I don't want students uh, diverge their some themselves from uh, to the other sites within the perspective of this course that we will be more helpful to our our students. Let me say. So you you provide them some uh, models from there they can yes. choose and give us one. Yes, yes. In the first seven, eight weeks, we provide them models and content of how they model the uh, vehicles, actually. Okay, so the models are a framework and not uh, design models in um, some software environment or something like that. Uh, they, they are actually uh, like the uh, dynamic models of the vehicles, uh, but we also provide their uh, implementation of uh, on some software simulation environments. Uh, like networks, LabVIEW, or uh, LMS, Amazon, Amazon environments by Siemens. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Any other questions? Okay, so we are a little bit behind on the schedule, so so we are going to finish. So thank you very much, and then we are starting the second session in one, two, four. Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, a yeah. picture together. Uh, like this. Yeah, so we can uh, sit here like, or yeah. We are going for the picture. Oh, yes. Very, very interesting. Uh, second kind of the same of Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we have been studying Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's part of it.
back. I start again. Good morning and welcome to the second session of research based in uh, approaches. My name is Piera Maresca and uh, I'm a associate professor for UPA. And um, I'm sorry, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, we we're going to leave the question after the at the end of all presentation of all speakers. And uh, I now I I'm going to to start. Okay, and uh, I give uh, to floor to Professor Calogero Otto from uh, Scuola, Scuola Superior Sant'Anna di Pisa. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, the research based learning in bioengineering. Thank you very much, Professor Otto. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Um, I would like to divide my uh, my talk today in uh, two parts. The first part uh, is uh, uh, very short, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I would like to uh, provide some insights uh, of uh, some case studies from my past uh, research-based learning uh, uh, as a student. So now I'm a professor, but uh, also I want to provide some insights from when uh, I was a student. Um, just to provide a, a few case studies, I would like to mention, I was a honor student of Santana School University, while in parallel I was a student uh, in uh, the University of Pisa. Uh, and I would like to mention some remarkable experiences I had the opportunity to undertake as an example in collaboration with the European Space Agency. Uh, including the European Parabolic Flight Campaign, you will see at the end of the, of the lecture of my talk some movies about that. And the uh, uh, European Space Agency Lunar Robotics Challenge that I had the opportunity to, to, to join. Uh, that was, uh, I would say, uh, research based learning. Huh? Uh, in which uh, you see, we're also very happy and uh, we're celebrating uh, with my colleagues and friends. Now, Professor Vitello is, uh, uh, we were together student, but now he's a full professor here at the university. And uh, we had the opportunity to build this robot from scratch and uh, bring it to the uh, Tenerife in the Teida Mountains in a scenario that resembles the uh, lunar environment. Uh, and uh, we learned uh, uh, our competencies uh, such as electronic system design, integration, sensors, actuators, control for mechatronics, data analysis, and above all, also reporting and grant writing. Because if you want to do research and if you want to implement your ideas, you should be capable to fund your ideas. So also write grants is a very important competence you have to gain uh, during your uh, studies, particularly during a PhD and teamwork, because complex challenges are uh, addressed by means of teamwork. Another important aspect uh, I want to uh, uh, remark uh, is uh, uh, with uh, uh, broadening. Broadening is a keyword in, uh, in uh, uh, our work package eight in ELISA, disciplinary broadening work package. Uh, during my PhD, I had the opportunity to broaden my uh, education from engineering, from core engineering competence towards the life sciences, and particularly in neuroscience. Uh, this was fundamental for my whole academic path. Also, now that I am a professor, you will see some uh, impact of these uh, broadening experiences I had the opportunity to undertake when I was a PhD student. So a very important topic is to broaden, uh, but to broaden in a non-dispersive manner. And this is something we are discussing uh, also with Maria that is uh, there, and uh, we are going to write in a paper uh, uh, that is standing from uh, uh, Work Package 8. Now let me go, Just I selected just two cases, uh, but three from my background uh, when, from when I was, um, was a student. Now let me focus on my research-based learning experiences 
as a professor instead. Um, these are just a non complete selection of some case studies I wanted to point to your attention. Uh, let's say the, the core uh, aspect here is uh, the combination of uh, teams, including a, a variety of uh, uh, different educational levels. So a variety of uh, students at different educational level from bachelor to master to PhD, all together working on, uh, on uh, uh, complex projects and mobilities. Mobilities is an important characteristic of ELISA. Uh, in my experience, uh, in this uh, part that I discussed, my experiences as a professor, uh, mobilities are very important, uh, and you, you will see in the take home message again. Just to mention some activities, uh, including broadening, and uh, in, uh, I'm trying to list, uh, list here uh, what is uh, in, in those projects, what is part of engineering competencies and what is part of broadening competencies. Each slide approximately is part of a published paper in a leading scientific journal. Uh, the, as an example, in this work, there was the master thesis of Mariangela. Now she's concluding her PhD. And in parallel, the PhD, it was part of the PhD of uh, Ilaria Cesini and uh, Elena Martini in a collaboration among different laboratories. Here we have integration of wearable haptic instrumentation, data acquisition, in LabVIEW, data analysis in MATLAB, 3D printing, polymer molding as a core engineering competencies, together with broadening competence, such as a scientific hypothesis on haptic perception, psychophysical protocols involving human subjects, technology safety and, te and certification for biomedical application. If you want to apply a biomedical technology with subjects, you should also verify the safety and, uh, uh, and undergo also a certification process and uh, approval of the protocol with pertinent ethics committees. So this is something that is required if you want to publish the results in leading scientific journals. Another example is in this summer school uh, I co-organized the University of Belgrade within a cooperative bilateral project. This was strongly research-based learning with hands-on activities. As you can see from those pictures and videos, we were together, professors and students, lecturing and doing hands-on in integrated robotic systems, demonstrators, platforms uh, involving control, data communication, sensors, experimental activities with subjects, and so on. And this is uh, uh, leading to, uh, this led to the publication, subsequent publication of journal paper, also involving after this experience with uh, the summer school, uh, also involving incoming master thesis from uh, other uh, universities, in this case from the University La Sapienza of Rome, from which, uh, with which we have a lot of uh, 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 collaboration. What is very important uh, also here is, uh, and uh, also the, the student, uh, the PhD, the, the speaker from FAU before was telling about this, to involve students in the papers, because they are the actor. So if, if you see here, students, the uh, uh, students that did the master thesis with us are authors of the paper. In some cases, depending on, on contribution, main authors of the paper. And the second point is to respect cooperation with your colleagues. If a, a professor sends a, a student to me, or I'm sending a student to another professor in another university, we jointly expect to discuss the result and to publish together, because this enriches and uh, co uh, uh, allows a better institutional cooperation. Otherwise, it is just a, a predatory migration flow. Instead, this way, to, with joint publication, with inter-university cooperation, we, we grow together. It's not a predatory approach. This is very important. 
And the, uh, in fact, if you can see here in this paper, we have uh, eight affiliations involving a lot of institutions with the mobilities that were involved in these studies. And by the way, we are going to organize a summer school on robotics and intelligent machines uh, next summer here. You can find uh, some details. So we expect to apply these methods exactly also on this initiative. Okay, so research based learning. So we teach in the summer school, but we expect also to achieve uh, scientific publication as an outcome uh, of the learning uh, activities. Uh, just to provide uh, some other insights on, on other direction, material science. And also here, it's very important in this study it was involving also Scuola Normale Superiore with uh, Pascual Antonio Pingue. Uh, it's very important to combine multiple competencies and not to have just a vertical. In this case, uh, including a finite element method the simulation, measurement uh, instrumentation with uh, SPM, the PFM, so very complex uh, instrumentation that is, was not available in our own institution. With cooperation, you can have access to excellence facilities and uh, increase, uh, increase the, the reach and the impact uh, of research and of the learning that the students undergo particularly also addressing broadening competencies, in, including the integration of various engineering fields, or also non-engineering fields in the STEM fields, such as chemistry, physics, material science, computational modeling, and safety, particularly with biomaterials. It's very important to, to educate the students to safety. Sometimes uh, uh, this is not very well uh, uh, addressed, or at least narrated. It's very important. Safety is fundamental. So when a student enters a lab, it's very important to also introduce the students in a safety um, a track uh, to educate the student with proper procedures, of course, in order for, uh, to achieve the learning outcomes and the research outcomes, but uh, without the risk for uh, his or her own safety. This is the case uh, of a, a master thesis under, uh, taken by Alice, which then became a PhD student, she was coming from Polytechnic University in Turin and visiting us. And again, here, joint publication involving the supervisor of Alice in Turin and our group as well. Um, uh, another uh, stream uh, is very important in, uh, in uh, biorobotics uh, is uh, the, the involvement between, and uh, as I was mentioning, the interaction with neuroscientists. Neuroscientists that give us Design, design criteria to develop uh, uh, computational strategies that are inspired to how the brain works uh, and how the brain implements uh, the um, computation of the sensory experiences. In this field, uh, just let me mention this study published in a prestigious uh, journal uh, with uh, Giacomo. Giacomo, uh, when we started this research, was a honors college student of my university for some time. Huh? And he contributed with clever ideas, particularly with the application of an artificial spike in neuro model, the Ziklich model, that was very important for the world development of my scientific uh, research. Another important aspect is dissemination. Dissemination is fundamental because if you have grants for uh, uh, funded by public agencies to do dissemination is fundamental. So in this case, it was things were disseminated in BBC. Fox News, international and national media, and to involve also students. Here, all those persons that are there are, are the students involved. It's very important also for the sake of their educational pathway and to enhance the impact of the research activities. Let me move towards the conclusion. I want to mention a few other cases involving mobilities of our studies. Some cases, as those that I mentioned before, were incoming visiting students. In other cases, we have outgoing visiting students. As an example, a student I'm not mentioning here for because there is some confidential information I cannot disclose. However, a student that I supervise was going to FAU in Germany for spending within the Lisa framework for spending a visiting period there uh, just the last winter. This is instead of uh, a period abroad of Luca. Now Luca has a very good uh, position in, in, in uh, technological innovation in the National Railways of Italy. 
uh, uh, he, uh, he spent this new period at the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, of uh, uh, American Space Agency, NASA. Uh, and uh, we had also here joint papers, joint paper with the um, American Space Agency and my group uh, together working on a project with research based learning on the student that went there and again joint publication of the results between the East all involved institution and the key person that contributed to the to the research some cases instead uh, the research start from a phd so full inside as in this case this was the phd of luca but the part that luca did in our institution but then so without uh, let's say contribution of additional students but then and, and this was published in soft robotics which is another good journal combining aspect of intelli artificial intelligence and finite element metal modeling but then to enhance the the results and to, to have a critical mass we had a lot of master students coming again from rome working together with PhD students and postdoc of my team under my supervision. And uh, this uh, resulted in a um, uh, milestone publication that we had last year in Nature Machine Intelligence. We also, by the way, got the cover of the job. Again, here, students involved in the publication, all involved institution partner in the, in the publication. These are important aspects beyond the, the, the core scientific competency, but it's a matter of style, it's a matter of approach. If we undertake a win-win approach, uh, it's, a, it's the way to, to, to allow a fruitful, long-lasting collaboration as those that I was mentioning. To conclude, um, let me just, um, do you have three minutes? I have three minutes? Two minutes, okay. Let me frame all these aspects within a more ge general aspect. Luca, my colleague, uh, Luca Valcarangi was mentioning Galileo. And uh, also here in this Harvard Business Review uh, uh, paper, uh, it was mentioned that uh, Renaissance Florence and in general Tuscany at the time was a better model for innovation than Silicon Valley. So, so in some sense, we are citing common uh, background uh, culture and legacy we have here in Tuscany. Let me frame uh, in, uh, everything in a uh, more general terms. Uh, I'm using this uh, uh, illustration with, uh, pro pro produced by Matt Might that I credit uh, in, in these slides. Uh, by the time you finish elementary school, uh, you know a little. So the knowledge you have is this circle. Then uh, when you finish high school, uh, you enlarge. You enlarge the circle of knowledge, but still in a isotropic manner, in isotropic manner, so without a polarization. Then uh, with bachelor degree, you start specializing progressively. And then with master, you, you deepen uh, that knowledge, uh, arriving, uh, read, reaching, uh, reading papers at the edge of human knowledge. But then uh, when you do a PhD, you should enlarge human knowledge. And this is what we do with the publications to advance knowledge. And then you should push the boundary up to when you are able to enlarge the boundary. That when you are a PhD student, and it happened also to myself, you are a bit selfish in some sense. It looks like this. So like this is a big circle and everything is with you. But um, Please don't forget the big picture. Our contribution is just that, that is part of a bigger frame. The, uh, and uh, some take home messages that enabling solution can come from the rest of the circumference and the, re the rest of the circumference can change priority, also addressing and impacting your research field, but communicate and share is very important to have impact. So uh, keep uh, pushing and welcome again uh, in PISA. Take a message to, say, to summarize, integration of vertical and horizontal competencies is fundamental. Broadening with other STEM competence or broadening towards life uh, sciences or uh, social sciences and humanities, this is a question. So a broadening as an example from electronics to mechanics, telecommunication, computer science, engineering, and so on, or also towards other disciplines. So depending on the specific project, you need to apply different strategy. 
very important the role of PhD student postdoc mentors when you have uh, junior students, that is fundamental. And uh, to summarize, calibrate efforts. When you have a, a junior student, you cannot expect in general terms to have the same achievements that you have when you have a PhD student or a postdoc. And this is very important to, to join forces with larger teams uh, involving also uh, multiple components and competencies. Recognize and give value to the contribution of all partners, institutions, supervisors, and students above all. We never publish a paper with a contribution of a student, uh, even after the student goes and goes in a company and so on. If we recognize a contribution, we involve the student uh, because that this is very important. Uh, we are trying to frame this within uh, publication. I was mentioning the publication with uh, Maria. Uh, Maria is leading this publication. We are going to finalize soon. We are, uh, pre it has been preliminary accepted. And above all, it's very important to enjoy. Here I was going back when I was a student. Uh, this is uh, myself uh, with uh, my colleague and friend, Nicola Vitella, now another professor of this university when we were students, uh, uh, master student at the time of the parabolic flight campaign. It's very important you have to enjoy your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adler. It was very interesting. Thank you. The next speaker is Professor Catalin Zaharia uh, from University Politecnica of Bucharest. Yes. And uh, he is going to talk about uh, RBL experience at UPV for bachelor and master's st student. Thank you very much. It's not this one. It's not the English. We want to thank them for me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers and ELISA project for giving me the opportunity to come here on this period and today to share some uh, RBL strategies in our university and more exactly in my faculty where I where I'm teaching. So I came from University Polytechnic of Bucharest. I am a full professor and uh, the head of the Department of Bioresources and Polymer Science. And also we are organized in a scientific uh, research group, advanced polymer materials group, and I am the scientific director of this, uh, of this group. And uh, today I will try to, first of all, to make a short introduction about our university and then about my faculty, and then to share some uh, RBL ex experiences and strategies in our university and our faculty, of course, uh, some of the strategies have been presented also in the morning by some other colleagues from uh, different universities. And of course, let's say the strategies are the same, but the experience could be a little bit uh, uh, different. But of course, they have a common, uh, common point. So only briefly about our university and uh, the faculty. So University of Polytechnic of Bucharest in, uh, is the oldest and the most prestigious engineering school in, uh, in our country. It has 205 years. Uh, we celebrated recently, so it's a uh, it's quite an old, let's say, uh, school from uh, from our point of view. We have five, 15 different faculties. We have research centers and institutes. We have laboratories, classrooms, and we have free campuses in uh, in different locations. Uh, I teach mainly in the Faculty of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology, so today I will share some, uh, let's say, chemistry information. We have also, we had in the morning some, uh, some experiences about chemistry and, and some uh, RBL ideas. So in terms of bachelor domains, we have chemical engineering, like organic chemistry, polymers, 
biochemical engineering, oxide materials, and so on. We have environmental engineering, we have food engineering, we have chemical engineering in foreign languages, German, English, French. And now we have a new, a new domain. We started last year the applied sciences, uh, applied engineering sciences with the bioengineering, and we'll continue this year with pharmaceutical engineering, nanosciences, sustainable and sustainable development. So I mentioned also these new uh, specializations because we are trying to introduce from the beginning the research-based learning throughout these programs. Of course, we introduce strategies in, let's say, in the classical uh, domains like chemical engineering, but it's somehow easier to introduce in a new program from the beginning the RBL concept. We have also some master programs where uh, we do a lot of research with the students, with dissertation thesis and also some other small projects. Okay, coming back to the research based learning concept, I won't uh, discuss about, uh, let's say, too much about the concept because uh, you heard also some information in the morning and uh, most of you know about the concept. It is an, in an interesting and important concept which involves students in the, in the research in general, projects or research during the labs and, uh, and so on. And I think this is the main, the main idea and the important part. We started, I mean, we are doing also a lot of research in the university. We have a lot of European projects, a lot of national projects. So uh, we started this idea of the research-based learning several years ago, uh, having Innova Biomed project in our university. Okay, the project has uh, finished, but we have also to implement a lot of other activities after the project uh, has ended. So this project was a good example so, of our build uh, concept because we had 11 teams and six faculties from our university involved. Uh, I won't enter into details concerning the faculties and the, and the labs. We had three main topics for the project, like advanced methods for biofabrication of biomaterials, integral solution for guiding of biomedical surface response, and new approaches in biomaterials characterization. And we have developed five labs for the first task, uh, four labs, five labs for the second, and seven labs. And because we have so many labs, so many new labs, of course, we said we have also to introduce the students here, the bachelor students, the master students, of course, the PhD students have been involved from the beginning, but it's not sufficient in, in our vision. So, of course, we have to, to go also to the bachelor and to the uh, master students. So, I tried to somehow, let's say, classify the strategies or add some, uh, some, some strategies. So, first of all, the first, let's say, idea is to introduce the research based learning in the curriculum of the lectures. And I told you at the beginning that we have some new programs and it's easier to introduce from the beginning in the curriculum, but also we try to adapt our lectures, our conventional lectures, taking into account the experience of the educators with the RBL concept and with the research in general to the students. Another idea is to introduce the RBL during the, uh, the labs with the students. Of course, we, I work in a chemistry faculty, so the labs focus on experiments, of course, but we try to change the paradigm. It, not 100%, of course, because we are trying to implement, but not to give to the students, let's say, the classical way of doing the labs, like this is the experiment, we have to do it and then just go home. We are trying to, to provoke them and to, my colleague discussed about curiosity and other, other uh, and to enjoy what you are doing. So we, we can provide them some ideas of a certain experiment, of course, and then they, they could just make a, uh, a survey and then they have the materials in the lab and throughout some weeks they can provide, let's say, the final results and the final, and the, the experiment could be performed not in one, week or in one session, but in several weeks. And I think this is quite nice for them, for some of them at least. The fourth idea is to, to, to use the concept and we are doing this in the last years during the diploma project with the bachelor and during the dissertation projects with the master students. Another idea, and we have introduced this several years ago, to use the research in the student scientific competitions. 
we have in our faculty, actually in the whole university, not only in the in our faculty, the scientific contest for the students. Usually in May, we have we had it uh, at, uh, in the first part of May, also this year. And this is also important because they are coming to this contest not because they are contests, but because they want to share some some uh, research ideas, some small projects, of course, under the supervision of professors and educators in general. And the last topic is the one I have started with to introduce the students within the research projects. Actually, there is one more, but about this, my colleague will discuss uh, uh, tomorrow the relationship with the industry. We have also heard in some previous presentations about this relation, but I do not want to detail more because my colleague uh, Jonut will present tomorrow. Here we have some uh, pictures from, from our labs, from the didactic lab, or the students. If my colleague in the morning, uh, in the morning Loredana, uh, discussed about uh, if we smile to the students and if the students reply. Okay, here we have one of the students with the mask, so we cannot see the smile, but on the left you can see some smiles. So sometimes they are smiling. Okay, probably not every week, every day, every year, every month, I don't know, but sometimes they are smiling. So it's quite, uh, it's quite important, I think. Um, some of our presenters discussed about um, uh, European uh, Space Agency. We had also a project several years ago, Igluna project. Actually, it was not our project. It was an, an European initiative by European Space Agency and the Space Agency in Switzerland, and they somehow offered on the market some topics, and we had to involve the students. And that is what we did. So you can see here a lot of universities from different countries, and uh, they had to prepare something, I mean, to prepare the idea of going to the Mars and to have the life on Mars. You know that we have a lot of ideas after 2030 to go also to create some habitats on Mars. Okay, so they work together. Of course, there were small teams for different countries. And finally, in, uh, uh, at the end of June, after one year, we had to go to Switzerland in the mountains in an uh, ice habitat. And our team, for, for example, they had to prove that they could obtain oxygen by a certain process, okay, we apply the electrolysis. And here we have the four students from our, uh, from our uh, faculty developing this kind of project. And this is also a good strategy for RBL concept. You, you, you have also here some, uh, some links, uh, some videos from Switzerland, and this, is, uh, this, is quite, this was quite nice. Another important strategy, and this happened uh, Two weeks ago, two students came to us, to me and to my colleague, Jon Woods, saying that we want to develop some cooperation with the hospitals and to provide them some models by 3D printing, prosthesis, and so on. So this is something also new for us. We didn't have this in the past. So it's related to student proposals, student passion, and uh, student interest, not for diploma project, not necessary for earning something like money, but for earning knowledge. And I think it's the passion that uh, motivates them somehow. So we said, okay, but we need the triangle, the university by educators, university by students and the medical doctors. And now we have a cooperation with uh, a uh, medical doctor. He's an imagist in a private hospital in Bucharest. And we are trying to provide this kind of CT and MRI scan and then to transform them in some digital models and to 3D print them. So we are at the beginning. I mean, my colleague Jonut has already helped the students to print the models, but we are at the beginning, so I cannot provide too, too much information for the time being. But it's also an example. We have also other examples with students also in bioengineering. We are trying to introduce within the diploma projects, different concepts like organ on a chip. So here we do not provide them. I mean, we provide the idea, let's say, and if they are interested in the idea, they could develop models by, by 3D printing. So here they can work somehow in teams by themselves 
of course, under the supervision of educators and, of course, by being helped by PhD students, for example, who have another experience. So here are some examples from our labs. And finally, they obtain something through a small research project, and then they go in front of a jury to, to, to defend the diploma project. But actually, it's not only the diploma project, it's a small project, which is more interesting than the classical way of, of having some themes and some to topics and, and so on. Uh, and this is possible because we have the infrastructure, we have research projects, so they can work on bioengineering, they can do a lot of bioprinting, 3D printing, and so on. So this is why, and I think the passion also and interest come from here, from what we can offer to them. Uh, the last two examples, and I will, uh, I will stop. In, uh, in January, we have the Winter School of Bioengineering and Polymer Science in uh, Bucharest. With, uh, organized by UPB and UPM from uh, Madrid uh, through ELISA project. And it was also a good example of RBL concept. Why? Because some professors from UPM and the uh, University of Polytechnic of Bucharest gave some lectures, but lectures based on research programs. But also we had some students from Romania, from Madrid, and also from FAO presenting something presenting some small research projects. And I think this is also a good example of an, uh, of an experience. And on the right, we had an uh, internship program in Paris. Okay, not through El uh, ELISA project, it's uh, another project, Athens, but it also, it was a good example. Some, uh, some students, some master students went there and uh, not only attended the lectures, but they developed also some small projects. And this is also important, okay. So I will uh, finish uh, soon. So I think it's important to have for, for the students, yeah, master students, bachelor students, PhD, to have ideas. Through RBL, we develop the critical thinking. Uh, we should have research strategies, but we should do also planning, brainstorming for the students. And then we have to implement our ideas. And finally, we may have a student who is somehow autonomous and so has autonomy. And I think it's a clear benefit for the market. And this is the last idea. We had also a festival in May in our university, a big chemistry festival, but it's not only the chemistry. Each year, every faculty has a festival. And in our opinion, it was also a good chance or a good opportunity to describe some RBL concept. So the festival was for the kids to attract the kids to our university, in this case, to our faculty of chemical engineering and biotechnology. But we uh, provoked the students to propose experiments, small projects, small experiments for the kids. And then they work together, students, educators. We try not to interfere too, to interfere too much, but we still help them the kids and also the industry and the research institute to work together. And you can see here a lot of smoke and a lot of chemistry and a lot of fun, I think. It, we had three days of real fun in the university. So I'm coming to the end. I won't uh, read what's on the slide. We have only some uh, RBL ideas from the literature and the specific characteristic of RBL. And now I'm concluding is that we have, all the activities are oriented to develop the student skills in research with what I said a little bit earlier, clear benefits for the society. If you think research is expensive, try disease. This is a quote for Mary Woodard Lasker. And I thank you very much. And I thank again Eliza Project for giving the opportunity to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Zafaria, a great experience for students and uh, professor too. And now the third speaker is Professor Balas Heta Kovesti. I'm sorry, sorry for my presentation. <laughs> From <laughs> Budapest University of Technology and the Economy. And uh, the, contribution, the contribution is organi organization for the first Elisa Scientific Student Competition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to show you some background 
and organizational details on the first ELISA scientific student competition. Uh, okay. So at first on the background and our aims, uh, there was one and one and a half year ago when we started to think uh, within the working work package five to to boost some some research based learning methods uh, one one year ago we had a very successful meeting in istanbul uh, uh, that was the first research based learning uh, symposium and that was really uh, very intensive and we get a, a huge impression how diverse methods we have on the research based learning uh, in the elisa uh, universities. Uh, but we had the, the idea not just to talk about the research based learning methodologies, but our students could show us how they learned the research uh, and, and, and what they learned uh, uh, via the, 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 the research. And uh, therefore, uh, we agreed at the Work Package 5 meeting in Istanbul that we tried to organize this, a scientific student competition where our students can prove and show us uh, what they learn uh, due to the, the research. Uh, and another aim of this competition uh, is also what it is also the aim of the work package five uh, that uh, the ELISA partners should learn the, the, uh, the, the research activities. So and, and this competition uh, is a very good chance to see what are the research interests of the ELISA partners, and we can learn uh, how diverse uh, we are within this uh, uh, the ELISA project. And we hope that it will be a sustainable event. So if we like it, if our students like it, uh, we can organize a similar competition next week and after uh, 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 in the future, and uh, we hope that it will also might have the, our second ELISA application and uh, 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 which could uh, uh, make this even sustainable. Uh, in Hungary, we have a quite long history for the scientific student competition, uh, uh, 70 years long history. And I would say that all uh, the top Hungarian scientists and industrial researchers were involved in this program. And the conference series is running in all the Hungarian universities. And I think the internationalization of this event can be a very good chance to bring our students together uh, from, from the different universities. So I would like just uh, uh, shortly introduce the entire process uh, to you. So the students started with their research work uh, together with their supervisors. Uh, the usual time period for this research work is uh, three to six months. Uh, we have this event each year, so maximum 12 months can be this research period. And uh, uh, the research period ends with the uh, research report, preparation of the research report which has a usual length from 13 to 16 pages. And the research report follows the layout of the usual international scientific journal paper. So it starts with the problem statement, uh, containing the research strategy uh, uh, and uh, the solution uh, methods, research results, evaluation of the results, and finally the future aims. Uh, when we get the, the, the research report of the students, we assigned two reviewers to each report. Uh, and the two reviewers evaluated uh, uh, all uh, uh, thesis. Uh, and at the conference this afternoon, uh, the students will take the uh, presentations, 10 to 12 minute long presentations following by a discussion. Uh, and there will be a jury in each session, and the jury will award uh, and, and uh, evaluate the presentation, and together with the reviewers, uh, they will rank uh, these reports. And on Friday, 
there will be an awarding ceremony. So uh, on this slide, I try to collect uh, what are the benefits for the students uh, attending on this competition so they can dig deeper into the field of the research. They can work with your with the supervisors together. They can learn from an authentic experts. And in Hungary, after the graduation, uh, universities, industrial partners ask students if they attended on a scientific student competition or not, and if they uh, earn an award, uh, that's, that's a huge benefit to our students. And so, uh, uh, in the work package five, we decided to have this event as a hybrid event. Uh, and it will be a special session of this research-based learning symposium. Uh, hybrid event because it was not manageable to bring all of our students uh, 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 from all ELISA partner universities uh, to PISA. So therefore, we wanted to give the opportunity to the students to join, but also online and take the presentations online. So the afternoon program, uh, uh, the first day uh, will uh, we'll have five sessions, social sciences, smart materials, informatics, architecture, and medicine. Uh, here you can see the location. So three rooms are here located in this building, and the first two sessions will be very close between the two and three minutes walkway, uh, but our organize, organizer will show us and show you uh, where to find the location, uh, the room of the sessions. And tomorrow we'll have four additional sessions, social sciences, two applied sciences, bioengineering, chemical and bioengineering, and built environment. And on Friday, we have the forwarding ceremony. Oh, here you can see just, just a very short layout of the presentations uh, in each session. So there is quite a uniform distribution. Uh, the minimum number is in the social sciences because from the social sciences, we have two sessions uh, and uh, the average number is uh, around eight presentations in each session. Uh, there's an important point that we will have a jury chairman's meeting tomorrow after the uh, the last presentation, so I judge around 5.30. Uh, so all the chairmen are asked to, to, uh, to sit down and discuss uh, the outcome of the competition. And uh, total number uh, is 70, 70 presentations so will be in this competition uh, in nine sessions. Okay. Uh, and then I would like to uh, say thank you to all of our supporters, patrons, uh, at first the uh, ELISA governing board, uh, Sophia helped us a lot and supported the organization of the student competition. I would like to say thank you to Ishtan Sabu, who is also here in person with us from Hungary, and he's the strategic director of the Council of the Hungarian Scientific Student Association. And he will also have a short talk uh, after my presentation. And uh, uh, special thanks to the organizing board, Professor Patarica. Uh, he was the chair of the organizing board. And also special thanks to our local uh, coordinators. Uh, uh, I get very, very strong support from Rosella and Daria uh, uh, from here. And also many thanks to Akif and Esra uh, from your support in the work at H5. Uh, and we have quite large scientific committee, uh, 35 uh, uh, academic staff members, professors are in the scientific board from seven universities. Uh, uh, the scientific board is also the reviewer and also the jury members. Also, thank you uh, to everybody who, who take uh, uh, and participate in this event. And I would like to shortly introduce the evaluation aspects. Uh, so there are two major parts. 
The first is the written, is the evaluation of the written part, evaluation of the research reports. Uh, two reviewers evaluated, both reviewers gave 60 points to the reports. We will take the average uh, of the point number given by the two reviewers and the jury, uh, the in presence jury will evaluate the oral presentation of the students and they can give uh, 40 points and from the 60 reviewer points, 40 uh, uh, jury points, the maximum achievable point will be 100. That is, uh, uh, and that, that will lead to the final ranking. So we are hoping for a very successful event uh, uh, as we usually have in Hungary. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to ask everybody to join the session and uh, 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 take the benefits from this scientific history competition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The last speaker is uh, Istvan Savo. Yes, it's Istvan Savo, but it will be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, yes, being a last speaker before lunch is always a very grateful thing. And uh, I'm the only one who stands between you and lunch, actually. Uh, but I'm happy to tell you that. Uh, it's a very joyful event for me because although right now you must feel hungry actually and also a bit tired, but you are taking part in quite a revolution actually. And therefore I have to thank you because you already do much more than your regular uh, regular uh, duties at universities. Because uh, in my opinion, if someone uh, goes to university, it's uh, it's quite obvious that he or she will get a degree, so it's nothing special to be very honest. But if you do something extra, then that's something. And not right now, we are doing something extra, and this is what you will do in the, in the afternoon as well. Uh, so I'm Istvan Sabo. Uh, I'm also an uh, associate professor at universities, I'm, and I'm also the strategic director of the Hungarian uh, National Student Research Societies. And uh, this society is, is, has quite a, a long tradition, actually, uh, in Hungary, as you see. So it's a, there's a 70 plus years tradition, and it's well embedded in the Hungarian legalization system as well. And this means that uh, it's also well respected, uh, and not just uh, from a societal part, but also from a legal part as well. And I think that it's, uh, it's very important to be as such, and I hope that. Uh, that is, uh, uh, could reach actually uh, similar achievements uh, in the later stages because it's important that the uh, results you achieve here will be actually uh, really respected by the uh, partners both in, in Europe actually and at other at the universities as well. So as you see, uh, our organization is, uh, is an independent organization and basically our aim is pretty much similar to that of Anissa without much surprise, actually, because uh, the, the main uh, logic or the main concept here was to somehow adapt this uh, best practice uh, to, uh, to the uh, project uh, Ariza, actually. And uh, when we uh, heard a lot of presentations on research-based learning, so basically this is exactly what, uh, what the SSA does, uh, because it involves students based on their uh, research interests, so they attend uh, these conferences and they, they bring the research topics which interest them most. They find their mentor and they are working uh, with them uh, quite on a close basis to find answers to questions they are, uh, they are seeking actually. And this uh, researcher's curiosity is a key uh, component, I would say, for the success. Because at already very early stage, uh, you can already experience that good feeling then you, then you are interested in something and actually you will have results and you will have findings and i hope that when you did your uh, research uh, uh, right now in the framework of Aliza, you also experienced something similar because this is what science is about and this is something which uh, we don't mention i believe often enough uh, it was already mentioned by balash how the uh, the competition and the and the jury level uh, uh, looks like uh, and um, uh, you see that uh, our symbol is the is the owl, 
because it obviously symbolizes uh, knowledge, science, and wisdom as it's uh, widely known uh, everywhere. Uh, and the, uh, if, uh, joining uh, this uh, uh, conference has obvious benefits, I would say. It is something similar, uh, like when they tell you that you should do a startup and you already learn something, even if you fail. This is the, the, the situation here as well. So by attending this conference, uh, you already have experienced this curiosity, this trying to find answer feeling, which is, I think, uh, a very good, basically an excellent uh, feeling as a researcher. Uh, so you already, even if you don't get an award, you already have an award, an, an emotional one. Uh, and yes, uh, we do have awards, uh, which actually signify those uh, uh, colleagues who, uh, who managed to excel somehow in the framework of this conference. And as it was uh, mentioned by Baj as well, not only the industrial partners, but for instance, in the, in the uh, researcher communities, it's a common uh, question actually, that what was your SSA topic? Uh, or did you participate in an SSA? And it's quite uh, funny actually to hear that uh, in, in various uh, conferences, when you attend those, the keynote speakers tend to, uh, to say that I have been part of the conference back in 2001, et cetera, et cetera. Even people from 1960X are there. So it's, it's quite an overarching thing. And it's, uh, uh, it's really a backbone of uh, research uh, 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 support as well. Uh, I won't go into details with, the work, with, with this organizational chart. You already seen too many uh, uh, graphs, I believe, uh, by now, or, or figures. Uh, the key message here is the one with the red, that the uh, SSA forms a critical mass of Hungarian researcher students. So uh, you will immediately see the figures. This uh, movement, basically, or these societies involve the excellent students again in a critical mass and not in a fragmented way. So again, if we if we uh, look forward and uh, we believe that Elisa, for instance, can be scaled up to a much uh, greater uh, level, basically by involving many more universities and many more students, then it can be again a backbone of the researchers' uh, the future uh, at European level, actually. Uh, we have different sections uh, than those uh, here. You see here that the scientific disciplines doesn't matter that you can't read the ones in the left because they are in Hungarian, but we have nice uh, pictographics. Actually, you see these are translated to English. Basically, everybody can find his or her respective uh, scientific field where uh, it's also important that the evaluation criteria are matched to that of the, uh, of the need of certain section. So here is an example, for instance, in the in the informatics section, for the purpose of this uh, Elisa uh, conference, uh, the the method was used as a, as a sort of a, a common denominator, which is used uh, in Hungary as well. So the the method which is used here is a proven and tried method, and you will undergo uh, in this as well. And it's also very important that the criteria differ because they somehow should address the different needs of the different scientific disciplines as well. So just to put this into perspective, and you can multiply these numbers at European levels as well. In Hungary, we have uh, uh, somewhat more than uh, 250,000 uh, higher education students, basically. Uh, among those, uh, we have uh, 14,000 who, who presented, actually, at uh, institutional level, so which uh, one was uh, talking about. Among these uh, people who presented at institutional level, at the national level conference, about 5,000 are presenting. And among those people, uh, some 2,000 uh, actually get some kind of award, and only uh, somewhat more than 500 of them gets the first place. For, uh, for presenting at the conference. And you see here the, the percentages as well. So these uh, first places, for instance, mean that among the all students in, in Hungary in higher education, 0.2% gets, uh, gets the first uh, place, which could be quite disheartening, actually. Uh, but if you uh, calculate this a bit, which is, again, a very nice exercise before lunch, but those who attend, actually, at national level, you will see that almost a half of them get some kind of award. So 
it's uh, the participation is, uh, although I mentioned the emotional factor, uh, we always try to make sure that some reward uh, is being given to those who, who excel actually uh, in their presentation, either in the first, uh, second, or third place, or there are even uh, special prizes. And we also have obviously awards for those who excel beyond those who were uh, first uh, place students. Uh, one of our uh, um, most prestigious award is the so called Procyantia uh, Award. This is a medal, basically, which you get physically as well. It's made of gold, so it's uh, it's a really prestigious. And those who have these uh, are really the best experts, actually, in their field. So if you have uh, uh, this uh, medal, then it's uh, more or less sure that in your future career, you will be uh, uh, a top scientist or a top businessman, uh, you name it. So basically, this is a seal of quality, actually, which is, I believe, important as well. It's also important that we also involve those who are the stakeholders among the young researchers community. So that's why we have, for instance, a journalist prize. We also award those who were the mentors of the students, because again, the critical mass must be built and must be uh, capitalized, basically. Uh, what we saw as uh, uh, success indicators and, and factors, you see here again some charts. Uh, I would say, and I would highlight basically uh, the, the self satisfaction uh, as, as the key point, as I mentioned, because again, if uh, there is a research question for which you try to find the answer, and you get that good feeling actually when you do, it's basically everything uh, or it's the best which can come out of, uh, out of uh, uh, the SSA participation. So as a conclusion, uh, we have a, a very long tradition, and uh, I would say that we are a best practice, which can be counted upon, and uh, we are quite uh, open to, to collaborate and bring this to a much more international level, because we at the same time see that somehow we should go well beyond uh, Hungarian borders, because finding good researchers and finding the new people for science, I would say, is always challenging. Finding the talents is always uh, challenging, because higher education is by nature is a mass education now. So you have to find those who actually want to do something which brings them above the, the masses actually uh, in, in the higher education. Um, and uh, last but not least, we also try to have uh, engagement with the society, like bringing live polls actually to student fairs. Uh, so I hope that uh, maybe next time we can bring an uh, old here as well to, to bring the, the spirit of the event, like uh, the colleague mentioned, bringing in uh, singing, we might bring then animals actually to, to, to operate with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Okay. So, sorry, and I forgot, almost forgot, yes, that uh, I also have to formally open the, the conference. And without further ado, I, I hereby confirm that the conference is open. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we have uh, time for only one question for each uh, speaker. And if uh, then you can ask them at lunch if they want. Okay, so uh, any question? Uh, yes, actually, we have a, a dedicated uh, monitoring system for those who have the ProCNCI award. They also have a society, actually, a dedicated society. Uh, so we know them exactly what they are doing and 
I mentioned that they are among basically the most successful uh, scientists or, or businessmen in, in Hungary. For the OTD uh, or the SSA uh, awardees, we are currently working in uh, implementing uh, a monitoring system because it's a tricky thing actually because of GDPR and everything. Uh, but we intend to build an alumni uh, among them. And this is a project which uh, we are intending to, to carry out basically in the very near future, basically in, in one or two years time. Uh, well, I would say that uh, no, we don't have a policy towards. Uh, what we see is, is roughly a 50 50 percent, uh, and it depends on scientific branches. For instance, in, in physical sciences, it's uh, it's more for, for males, like in the other parts of uh, science, but for instance, in, in uh, psychology or education, it's more for the females. So. And that's why I say that on an average, it's a, it's a, it's a 50, 50, 50 percent. If I may make a comment in this respect, uh, uh, by the way, I also said that uh, Santana is a uh, president of the University Committee for Wellness, Inclusion and Against Discrimination, which is named the Comitato Unico di Garanzia in Italian. Uh, so we are very attentive in this and also uh, disseminating some of our actions uh, uh, within the LISA network and discussing together. Let me remark that as an example, in biomedical engineering field, uh, we have very good balance. Uh, as you have seen uh, from the pictures I've shown uh, and also the, the composition, not only of my team, uh, several teams, uh, uh, the, the, there is a very good balance, not only in Santana, this is in general international. So I fully agree with you that it depends on the central branches. Clearly, we have to act uh, uh, so that uh, biomedicine, bioengineering is not the exception uh, within uh, STEM, but uh, uh, to allow a proper balance uh, in uh, in uh, several disciplines, as an example, in uh, Elisa Inokora, I collaborate with Professor Simona Gallerani. She is an associate professor in physics at Scuola Normale Superiore. And uh, I think uh, probably the, the presence in, uh, of female scientists probably is much lower in the field of physics. Uh, but uh, as a, recently, Scuola Normale Superiore recruited a full professor in, in, in computer science that is a female and so on. So, I mean, we have to discuss it in a fully integrated uh, framework uh, uh, so that we can uh, uh, break the barriers of uh, specific disciplines. Maybe we can also prom promote some prizes and awards to stimulate a better gender balance uh, in STEM fields uh, uh, within the list. So, Let's discuss all this uh, if you would like to. Thank you. Let's say that the chairperson today was female, so we have a good point. So, so we are justified. So, uh, we were chaired by a female anyway. So, the commander in chief was a female. Anyway, you're right. It's a, it's a, uh, the, there is a rule uh, no panel without the gender balance. So, it's very important. A question? No? Uh, thank you very much for attending this session. Uh, thank you for uh, to the speakers and uh, we have the information about the event. Thank you because I, I wanted to make an important announcement because today uh, coffee break and lunches uh, are uh, prepared from uh, Catherine del Cuore, which is part of the LALPA Association, which is a profit organization which employs people with disabilities uh, to create uh, a shared space and opportunities uh, for socializing and towards social integration. So Scuola Santana and Normale decided to uh, choose the LALPA Association for this event today as a sign to support the ethical values of solidarity and inclusion that the alliances for Susan and Nancy. Thank you and uh, have a, a good lunch.